I've taken a special interest in Islam lately, and one of the big things I do is I look at the biblical criticism I've learned from Judaism and Christianity and all the literature involved, and I see so many patterns over here in Islamic literature, the Quran, the Hadith, the traditions. I see a lot in common. I also see, though, preservation here that's better than what we have in the early biblical literature. Whatever that means, it doesn't mean ontologically these things are true. It just means maybe people have learned a trick or two along the way. Check out this fascinating interview if you're interested in wanting to understand actual scholarship and depth about Islamic literature, the variants, and whether it's been preserved. This is the video for you. We are Myth Vision. Welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. Your host, Derek Lambert. Ladies and gentlemen, the caliber that I have brought on today uh, in Islamic studies is, I like to say, impeccable. I'm not kissing his butt. I'm just being honest here to say <laughs> Marain Van Putin is right. a ling linguistic monster. And I don't mean that derogatorily. I mean, this guy is all over. If if Dr. Sean Anthony is saying, ah, no, 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 you need to listen to this guy, then then I'm going to peek my ears and pay attention. So I just want everyone to know, welcome to Myth Vision Podcast. We're going to be talking about uh, lots of stuff, lots of different things pertaining to Islamic studies, specifically the literature. And thank you for joining me. Yeah, happy to be here. Thank you. I want to give quick thing out of the way, if you will. He has a book and specifically he he's an expert when it comes to Berber, the language. And so not probably the culture as well. I suspect to know the language, you got to know a lot more. But uh, yeah, if you're interested in checking that out, here it is on Amazon. He also has an academia.edu website. You can go and read a lot of the articles that he has published. And so check him out there as well. All of this is down in the description. He has a book that will be coming out in, in the series of this vein. The book is going to be titled Quranic Arabic from its Hijazi origins to its classical reading traditions. That will also eventually, not right now, but eventually will make itself down into the uh, description. So if you guys are checking this out and you see it, go check out the book. The guy knows what he's talking about. And last of all, I have a Patreon where all of this material, including this video, was released before it's to the public. So if you're seeing this on YouTube, the Patreon members already watched this first. And I interview academic after academic, and we go into question after question. Who did Jesus think he was, for example? Uh, Joseph, of, Joseph of Arimathea, is he a literary character? Did he really exist? Was it really a place of Arimathea? Uh, there's all sorts of stuff going on and different scholars that I've interviewed. I mean, right here we have uh, Delcy Allison Jr. The list goes on. So if you want to help us out, keep the lights on here, and you want to maybe steer the direction this channel goes in terms of asking questions, you can join the Patreon and message me there. All right, let's get right into the juicy stuff because we've got too much to discuss. And um, once again, thank you for taking the time and, and coming on. Yeah, no, I'm very happy to be here. And uh, just, just one one thing I want to add. Um, so my book that's coming out, it'll be open access. So it'll be free for everyone to read, uh, which is wonderful. Um, so I'm very happy that I that I managed to get that to, to get going. So I look forward to that. I always appreciate that because when you have an academic work by an academic publisher, oh, they hit you over the head. And the, I think there's a lot of politics behind it, but ultimately it's this whole idea that the libraries and they think not many people are going to purchase it. So they hit these libraries up and these libraries will be willing to pay the hundreds of dollars for one copy. Yeah. But th I think media is going to start changing that. And maybe these publishers will start realizing that more people are interested in the depth that you mm. guys are presenting than they really know. They think everyone has to go to a two to five, six year college to be interested in what you're talking about. When guys at home right now on the internet are looking at what you're doing and going, whoa, go check out Marin. Is it Marin? Marin. 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 Yes. Marin. I'm sorry. You're the first time. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Marin. Marin, I'm I'm literally going to accidentally um, make mistakes with this with language and stuff here, so I'm new to this area. But I say I say let's dive head first. Yeah, and let's do it. I'm going to use analogies from what I do know, which is biblical studies, 
and you know obviously the biblical tr tradition whether it's judaism or christianity to kind of like get why i'm interested in this field i think and this is my opinion you don't even have to comment on that all of these religions are um man made they de developed from the creativity and the imagination of man with the current current cultural context whatever elements that might be that helped to create and develop what we see so that's my opinion right a lot of people will disagree especially in, in, when it comes to the quran and most people are muslims are like no this is perfect and they have a tradition that i don't even think medieval scholars agreed with these kind of ideas that's right. going to be the interesting point and i'd love to see them grow up and I, I don't mean it in the derogatory sense i mean it like i had to grow up many people who are realizing that every single word jot and tittle to use a biblical term is perfectly preserved and whatnot so the first question i have for you is simply this is the quran is that am i saying that correctly yeah yeah i mean for, for an english man it's quran but quran. you can say quran i say quran all the time quran. That's how I say it. Yeah. i'm trying <laughs> is the quran preserved in the theological sense dot for dot because i know the first question if i ask is it preserved is hmm. well what do you mean by preserved right, right, and right. so i'm asking in the traditional fundamentalist sense where people are out there acting like everything is inerrant infallible dot for dot from right, the original right. is that the case yeah so so i mean it, it, it's exactly as you said like um how do you define preservation right uh and that's that that's really a you know a question that's that's not always that easy to answer and you you, you jump right in with with a difficult question so let's try <laughs> um so you know when we're talking about the quranic text um it is known it is a very very stable text uh it has actually changed very very little uh from right. its canonization uh, around 650 um and i i i'm Pretty firmly believe that, that the Quran was standardized as the tr tradition tells us by Uthman. He had a standard text created, sent it out um, to, to different parts of the world and of the Islamic world, of course, at the time. Um, and after that, the text basically hasn't changed. Uh, that's true. Uh, what has changed? So, so essentially, so he, he has four copies made of the text, and those differ a little bit from one another. And those differences um, are probably just a result of scribal mistakes. Uh, the differences that are there are really tiny. You know, one says, and he said, and the other one, a verse just starts with he said, and and is missing. Well, that's not another theologically very important thing. So why would you put that in there in, on purpose? Now, um, so, so that's one thing you get. You get, you know, a text that is somewhat different in these different regions, but very tiny. I mean, it's, it's a very, very small number. So we're, when we're talking about it, um, we're talking about about 40 differences, maybe a tiny bit more. Um, and those are the differences between the texts. And after that, um, the text has been copied meticulously. And even those four, your first four copies are very meticulously copied. And basically, um, the text as we have it today is more or less the same as the way that Rahman has standardized it. Um, more or less, I say, uh, there's some spelling differences. So some words change spelling over time, um, but you know they change spelling over time. So small, small spelling differences. Uh, but in terms of words, it's word for word identical to Rahman's text. Uh, it really is. And you know you can say whatever you want. Every now and then you'll find a manuscript and someone forgot uh, to write something. You know it's right there. Um, sometimes you find a manuscript um, where something was changed for one reason or the other. Uh, but usually it's 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 um, there's not that many. I mean these things are copied very very carefully. And what you don't get is say inherited changes. So after these these first four copies, which do have some spelling differences, which seem to be inherited by all the manuscripts that come after. If you see some kind of change happening in the manuscript, we don't see that spread into other manuscripts. So really, you know, from 650, that's more or less when the text was fixed. And people don't really touch it anymore. You know, you don't get added verses, you don't get added surahs or, or, or changed verses or these kinds of things. Basically, uh, it, it's quite stable. Now, 650, um, it's still sometime, and 650, uh, that's kind of a, a general thing, but it's during the reign of Uthman, which, who lived, well, reigned from 45 to 
50 something. Um, that's know, still exactly early, enough. though. If we compare it's, it's it, extremely to early, biblical... extremely early. So, so, so the point is, yeah. it is after the death of the prophet, um, right. and uh, so there, 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 there's, let's say, you know, at, at minimum, at least a decade in between his death and when they wrote it down. Now, all kinds of things could have happened in between that time. Um, it is not. There's no voice recording in between. So, can we know? Um, whether whether the text um as we have it in the Uthmanic text is exactly identical to how the prophet said it or mm -hmm. or revealed or had it revealed saying um i mean we just can't know um muslims will offer, often say well you know he, he was an impeccable companion of the prophet so why would he have done it differently um uh, that can be a good religious reason to believe it preserved just fine um but at the same time uh you know, from a, from a historical perspective, we just can't prove that. You know, we can't say, well, we know for sure that uh, that it's exactly as it was intended. Uh, you know, some time after, uh, but it's a very short time. I mean, it's it, it, even a distance between that. So whatever happened there, um, you know, it, it depends. But you know, there's a good chance that it that it did not have a, a massive change and go through a massive change. And we can talk a little bit about that because we'll, I think we'll talk. Uh, I'm sure a little bit about companion codices, the Sana Palimpsest, and that kind of shows the kind of variation that was around in the text. So uh, we'll get to that. So yeah. is it preserved? Well, it depends how you define preserved, but it is certainly a very stable text and very early on. Yeah. Now, when they say dot for dot and they mean it theologically, would mm -hmm. you kind of put a question mark on that and say, hold on, hold on. Um, it's very preserved. Okay. If mm. you looked at it without a bias, let, let me, right. let's take off theological glasses and just look at this as a historian, the same way I would maybe ask you to look at a, a let's say a second century document or something mm. biblically, right? You right. will approach that. I want you to not care what Christians think, so to speak right. and say, right. okay, um, maybe it's not what fundamentalist Christians down in Florida who are in a, you mm. know, fundamentalist, uh, literalist church. Yeah, it's not that it's not that kind of preserved, but it is very preserved and you can give your explanation. Would that be fair to say that historians who are approaching this without kind of the traditional lens are going to say, well, we have good reason to say this is far better preserved than what we see in biblical studies, but yet mm -hmm. it may not be perfectly preserved, identical right. dot for dot. Yeah, so 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 there's an interesting interesting um so yes, it was incredibly well preserved, right. and we, and depending on what you call perfect, right. um, is it, kind of what it comes down to. So so let's put it like this: um, what I just told you, basically, all these things that I just told you about about the text, yeah. these are all things that the Islamic tradition knows and says is true. Right? They right. are aware that there are differences between the, the, the codices because they recorded them themselves. We have medieval literature that says, you know, uh, the the uh, Mus'haf, uh, so that's that's the name for the codex uh, right. of the Quran, in Kufa um, has this variant and the one in Basra has this variant instead. And to them that apparently was not an issue for, for you know, believing that the text was preserved. Um, if you're like, well, that's not what preserve means to me. I mean, that's fine, but that's clearly, you know, how they understood the text. They understood the text to have differences. They understood the text um, to be recited in different ways. And that did not get in the way of them thinking the text is preserved. And right. so maybe that perfectly is, is, is I, I don't know, I, I think it's a bit of a, Almost, almost a red herring. Um, are are they really talking about perfectly? Uh, and what what where is the perfection in this, right? And right. and um, I think people get a little um, distracted by this, also through the polemics that go around uh, uh, around about this. But it's of course absolutely absurd um, to see these kind of polemics between, say, you know, uh, Christian fundamentalists and, and Muslims, where the Christians are saying, "Look, your bo book isn't preserved." It's like, well. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> Good but, point. <laughs> um, but you you literally do not have anything, you know, like the first 200 years. And then you have like a credit card size thing. It's like, well, the Quran is complete. Um, we have really a complete Quran, basically, um, in fragments, right, uh, of different manuscripts, multiple times attested within the first century. Um, that is just not something you can say about the Bible at all. 
uh, and it's you know front front to back. And you know there are some bits that we don't have multiple attestations of, but we basically have the full text in the first century. In, in really first century, he's yeah. talking about the first century of oh, yes. uh, Muhammad V. So, so no, no, yes. I just want to clarify yes. for audience. He's yes. probably so, is, Islamic, so is, Islamic calendar starts at um, the the migration of Muhammad to uh, Medina, right? Uh, which is about ten years before his death. So that that puts it somewhere for you. I just um, want to yeah. get like people used to that on my channel because they're going to hear more yeah. academics from Islam. Yeah, yeah, say no, first century, it, it second time. century. I'll certainly, when I'm <laughs> talking first, second, third century, that's first, second, third century Hijri, and I'll certainly be doing that. I try to recalculate, but I'm balanced. It's okay. Uh, no, no, no. Yeah. I appreciate yeah. that, and I respect that. And yes, I think that that's hypocritical of Christians to run mm. around and want to try and uh, you know, do that, and then not even mm -hmm. no, no, no. We have preservation, and P fifty two is the earliest, right. like, like you said, credit card, not even credit card, like smaller no, no. size fragment, and that's what you're hinging on. So, right. yeah, I mean, there's tradition there, and this is what mm -hmm. I also see in Islamic studies. So, let's follow up to the next question, and I'm going to do my best to pronounce some of this. What is mutawatir, and uh -huh. are the kirat reading traditions uh, mutawatir? Are they? How many mm -hmm. total mutawatir kirat? are there seven mm -hmm. or 10 mm -hmm. or 14 mm -hmm. or 25 like there's different right. so how would you answer that yeah so so i, I think we have to probably um start with a couple of things so first so so mutawatir um i might also use the word tawatur which is the general concept is is a a word that is used in in say say criticism of, of transmission uh within the islamic tradition which means it's a tradition that is so incredibly well and widespread that there's no way it could not be true. Because right? there's all these independent people who, who transmit the thing. It's like, you know, it's, 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 it's as obvious um, as, as anything that, that, that the text is, uh, and that there can be no doubt that it goes back to the prophet. So usually this is about sayings of the prophet and not necessarily about the Quran. And does it even make sense to talk about the Quran in this way? That That's one question. Um, <laughs> uh, that it, it, you have to kind of wonder about. Right. Um, but that doesn't take away the fact that these days it's very common to say, and it, it's, it's an old old idea, but it's not, not as old as the readings themselves, that the readings are uh, mutawatir. So you also use the word qira'at. Um, so that's the plural of qira'ah, which is a reading or a recitation of the Quran. Um, and so this is an interesting thing about, about, about the Quran, I think very fascinating, something that I, that I work on a lot, is the Quran, if you have this text, uh, and it's a Semitic language, and like many Semitic languages, um, there weren't really ways to write vowels, and the Arabic script is even more ambiguous, and it's even often not possible to tell some consonants apart. Which means that technically, if you have the Quran in front of you, you could read it in an infinite amount of ways. Right. There's not an infinite amount of ways to read it. I mean, you can, of course, read totally nonsensical things into it, but it's like it doesn't say that. We know that the Quran is, you know, not talking about oil. Um, that's a, that's a famous one, uh, where where the first verse, kitab la raiba fihi, uh, which is uh, there's no doubt within this book, um, that one of the reciters accidentally read raiba as zaita, and that means. There's no olive oil in this book, which it obviously doesn't say, right? But yeah. you could read it that way. Now, so as the time progressed, people had this text and the you know the standard standard of manic text. And we also have non of manic versions. We'll talk about that later, I'm sure. Um, they could interpret this in different ways. In some of these places, it was ambiguous, right? We all know, and nobody reads it with, with olive oil, but they might read other words slightly differently here and there, you know, something like, okay, he created whatever, or he was created, or it was created, right? These kinds of things are, are quite uh, close and basically have the same meaning. Um, so we have these different traditions and different famous people, basically, who spread their way, their interpretation in some ways of the text of what it says, what it's supposed to mean. And um, and there's a kind of artful component to this, right? So there are linguistic differences, there are recitational differences, um, which are very important. Recitation in the Quran is, is part of, of, say, what makes the book holy to, to, to Muslims. And... Um, so then the question becomes, okay, these people, so we have a couple of people, let, let, let's mention a couple of names, say uh, Nafia, who was the Medinan uh, reciter 
in the middle of the second Islamic century. And towards the end, I think, yeah, he died in 169. Um, and uh, so, so he has his way of reading. And then you have someone like Abu Amr, who's a bit earlier, and he's from Basra, and he's a recital of Basra, and he reads it quite differently from, from, from Nafia. Um, and these would, they would, they would um, spread their reading to other people, and those would then pass it on and pass it on through a chain of transmission. And even today, if you learn to recite the Quran, you will have a chain of transmission all the way back to these famous reciters. Um, so you can, and then all those famous reciters have their own chain back to the Prophet. Uh, in some way, they're all connected to the Prophet uh, in that way. Now, um, that's kind of what's going on with this. Now, the question is, are these transmissions mutawatir? That is, are they so widespread that there can absolutely be no doubt that there's no mistake in it? Um, from the canonical reciters onwards, yeah, probably. Uh, you could say, you know, the canonical reciters are extremely widespread. Nobody is disagreeing. And there's some small disagreements here and there on tiny words. But generally, like, probably 99.9% of, of a recitation is the same, no matter if you go, say, to you know, Indonesia or you go to, that would be a terrible example to say Morocco uh, because they have a different recitation. Um, if you go from Indonesia to say, I don't know, Saudi Arabia, they, they would be pronouncing the same. And, and that's very widespread. Every, everybody who recites the Quran can do that, sure. But the essential point here is that's up to the reciters. And then going back to the Prophet, it's actually not an all that super widespread thing at all. Uh, some readings are only read by a single reciter. Um, and if that is a single, so, so one, one specific word is, so, well, if you take the whole system, right? Only one reciter recites that way and then spread it. And we cannot trace that back. We can't say, well, his teacher recited exactly like that too. No, no, we can see very clearly that teacher students have slightly different readings. So they make word choices. And some of these word choices are very widely attested. And, you know, like seven of the 10 readers read it in one way and three in the other. And the seven, okay, that's maybe super widespread. You could say that has tawatur, it's mutawatir. Um, but others are read by only one uh, and only one, one reader. There's no way you can say, well, this is Mutawatir because it's only one person who spread it. And, you know, he's 100 years after the fact, at the least. So, um, no. And this is also something that was recognized by the, by the tradition. So at some point, um, so in, in the early, early period, everybody's like, okay, it's very important that, that you have a good chain of transmission back to the prophets, of course, right? And you have to say how you got this recitation why etc but you don't get it for every single word like okay i learned this word from this person that word from that person we just don't have that kind of detail mm -hmm. just know who were the teachers these kind of things so in the beginning I say it's very important to have a good chain of transmission but nobody said this is tawatur this this, this has mutawatur you know this has tawatur or it is mutawatur um they just said good transmission there we go and at some point this 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 idea develops no 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 it's not just good transmission it's the best possible transmission right there's no doubt how good this transmission is. Um, and that has become more or less the orthodoxy these days. It's not something that was went completely unchallenged. So famously, uh, Ibn al-Jazari, who is um, a, let me say this right, 14th century scholar. Um, so our, our, our accounts a 14th century scholar. Right. Um, who canonized uh, the three readings after the canonical seven and his 10 readings are today considered, you know, impeccable and mutawatir. But he himself says in his book, I don't think they are, which is a very interesting thing that people find all kinds of interesting ways <laughs> to, to read that text in, in a way that words just stop having any meaning at all. Um, but he doesn't believe um, that is, it's a case. He says, and he clearly thinks that most of most of the recitation is, but he says, you know, for every single word we cannot make for every single reading that's possible, we cannot say for every single one of them they're absolutely uh, mutawatir. Um, so that that's tawatir. Um, Quick question on that though, if yeah. I may, uh, before we get to the next question, is do we have any clear examples of catching people? Uh, let me give you one analogy. <clears throat> the analogy mm -hmm. would be. 
there's definitely this supposed line of apostolic transmission from Peter uh -huh. through uh -huh. the Orthodox Church. When right. you really go back and critical right. scholars look at this, they're not really, they're like, yeah, that's tradition that comes later. Like people are trying to be authoritative. So they're putting back that they connect themselves to Peter. This right. is the same problem that Gnostic Valentinius did when he's arguing, oh, no, no, we go directly from Paul. And mm -hmm. Marcion, I'm from Paul, right? Pa Paul is their apostolic transmission, whereas right. others say Peter. Um, we have good reason, not saying we can prove it, but we have good reason to doubt some of this apostolic stuff is just a later polemic. Is there any mutawatir that we can look at and say, you know, this sounds more like you guys are trying to lay authoritative claim, or does it? Is that a bad analogy? No, no, no. It's 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 it's, it's a good analogy, I would say. Um, so one thing to 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 really really be aware of it, and something I think I think a lot of people in Islamic studies are very enamored by for good reason, is that there is no no historical tradition. Um, you know, from 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 pre-modern times, that is as meticulous about this kind of stuff as you know uh, the Islamic tradition is. Islamic tradition goes to extreme lengths to figure out: okay, is this person trustworthy? Is this train of tra transmission does it make sense? Um, uh, you know, is it is it plausible that these two people would have met each other? Do we have reasons to think that this guy is a liar? Right. You know, and they go through all, all the details. And we have big books, uh, tomes that are collecting these kinds of things. And of course, hadith, so same sort of prophets, um, are graded, right? They say, you know, this one is good, this one is bad, this one is unreliable, and wow. uh, that's very important. Um, so, which doesn't mean it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are some, say, hacks in the system to allow. Um, certain things to work out and people would sometimes just completely make up uh, chains of transmission. Uh, those happen and you can see them and you can kind of work out the networking. It's like all of a sudden there's like all these made up names and we have no idea who these are and that's obviously made up. Uh, but very often the tradition recognizes that themselves as well. Um, now at some point, of course, you stop being able to verify it. You can see, you know, if multiple people are transmitting the same tradition and they all have a chain back to the same person, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But then the chain back from that person all the way back to the prophet, that's just a straight chain. Who knows? Maybe they made it up. Maybe it's real. Um, very often there's good reason to think it's perfectly acceptable. But at the same time, the time that that really gets formalized is also sometime after the death of the prophet, not, not from the time of the prophet they had like, okay, this is the formal way that we'll do transmission now. You know, before it was just, you know, I heard this thing and someone told me and you get these kind of uh, somewhat vaguer transmissions that way. Now for the Quran, um, not so obvious, uh, not, not in any obvious way. So, so once we look at like the transmissions up to the canonical readers, uh, so after the canonical readers, th those look just it's fine. It's fixed. Perfect. Yeah. It's fixed. But the steps back to the prophet, that can be quite hard. And, um, sometimes they look realistic and acceptable. So some things we can see is some of the canonical readers that we know are students of other canonical readers. And. So we can see that Hamza, who is the Kufan, uh, one of the Kufan reciters, his student was Al Kisa'i, who is one of the other Kufan reciters, and those two readings are very similar. And obviously, because you know, they were in teacher-student relationship with each other, so that makes sense, right? They 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 realize. Um, so they made some changes. They they don't have the exact same recitation, but they are clearly transmitting from each other and have learned from each other. So we can confirm that chain, so to speak because we have both their readings this the makes me think of the synoptics by the way like the whole right. synoptic problem how right. mark yeah, yeah it's very massive, similar to that yeah, yeah exactly. it's like they're not yeah. two separate eyewitnesses well you is it possible right. that yeah but it looks more like literary uh right. somehow they're in the same right anyway. exactly so you so you find these kind of connections and then we're like we have a, we have a couple of things about some of the readings we don't really have a complete transmission but they clearly are kind of in that line so with the kufans I, I would say that that transmission is quite good so we can say al kitsai certainly learned from from uh, hamza hamza certainly learned from al amash and al amash learned from i think a sulami if i'm getting this right and then uh, ibn mas'ud who was one of the um uh, uh one of the companions of the prophet and, and, a, and a prominent one um and that chain i think we can confirm basically every step of the way and have a pretty good sense okay now that this really seems to be true with other ones so uh, a particularly problematic one is uh, ibn amir ibn amir is a syrian reciter 
And we have two transmissions from him. Um, and they both converge not on Ibn Amir, but his first student. So there's only one student from him, and from him, everything else uh, diverges. So we have absolutely no way that to know that even Ibn Amr's reading is the one uh, that, that we have today, because basically we have the reading of his students. And mm. we say it's Ibn Amr's reading because the student said it's Ibn Amr's reading. This is how I learned it. Um, so do we know for sure? No. And there's a couple of more issues. Um, according to the tradition, Ibn Amr lived to be 108 years old if i'm getting this right but at least way over 100 which is very very old like it could have happened but yeah. um but it seems to perhaps be there to occasion the possibility for him to have actually learned the reading from Afman directly which is probably not the case um and so there's there, there's some problems with that one um and there's some other chains as well, which look a bit more realistic, but he would still have to have been really, really quite old. Um, so, you know, what's going on with that? Who knows? Um, and yeah, we don't know. Uh, so we don't know. We don't know where he got his reading from. And we were, there's good reason to kind of doubt he got it the way he got it. And with many other ones, it's like, well, there's nothing that looks particularly problematic and it might even be true, but there's no way to be sure. And um, it also, it doesn't doesn't take away the possibility that they added in some new readings or new interpretations of a text where they did not necessarily have an example from their teacher. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, that was well detailed. Um, how many variants exist in the whole Quranic corpus? Mm -hmm. An approximate yeah. number. Ooh, an approximate number. Um, yeah. So it's not very many. Um, if you think about about the text. Uh, so the Quran has about 70,000 words, if I'm getting this right. And I think about 2,000 words are disagreed upon uh, within the canonical readings. So that's, that's a fraction, right? It's, 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 right. it's, it's less than a, than, than a percent, I think. Um, but someone else can do that calculation for me. But it's very close to that. So it's, it's really, really a small number um, of differences in reading um, that have some effect on the meaning of the text or or some 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 way of that um very few of them and um um and this is after the this. fixed yeah. this is the fixed yes this yeah, is yeah, after okay. so we're, we're canonical right. readings are basically fixed and everything so um there are a couple of other things uh there are non-canonical readings and they add a couple more and it's probably probably in a couple of thousand more after that um and some of those are per perfectly reasonable readings and some of them are like that's kind of weird um yeah. so so there, there might some of those are probably just real i mean they're considered non-canonical because they're not part of the canon not because there was something wrong with them and that's really also how they seem to think about them um so it's you know uh they, they don't get rejected for being non-canonical it's just the canonical ones have a special status in that sense and so that's one thing. But another thing to think about is if you actually start looking at this. So some of these variants that we're talking about um, have an effect on the whole text. So, for example, uh, and this is no no linguistic meaning. It has no meaning in terms of uh, meaning of the text, uh, but it has an effect on how it's recited, which is a very important part of this text. So as an example, if you take the word uh, upon them, uh, in most reading traditions, that's pronounced as alayhim. But in one reading, it's pronounced alayhum. And in another one, it's pronounced alayhimu, or two other ones, actually, within the canonical transmissions. And then outside of that, you get alayhum, uh, you get alayhumu, you get alayhimi, you get um, a whole, whole uh, range of other options. Well, every time you say upon them, you pronounce it that way, right? And that's the case with lots and lots of words. So we have all these, whenever you say wahua, which means and he, uh, if you're reading Abu Amr, you're supposed to pronounce it as wahua, uh, which is the same word, it means the same thing, but every time that happens, which is hundreds of times in the Quran, you pronounce it differently. So as a result, even though there's very few variants, there's hardly a single verse in the Quran that is pronounced exactly the same in all readings, uh, all the canonical readings that are around. But they're all they're all these kind of linguistic 
tastes uh, basically that that are put into the text by the reciters, and this is very much part of the the, the artful performance. Um, so simultaneously, um, basically every single verse has a variance, but also it's very few uh, because anything that that really matters is is very few of them. And even the ones I gave this number two thousands, many of these are very tiny differences. You know, right. differences that basically come down to whether you pronounce a word with one vowel or the other, which doesn't have any real effect on the meaning. Um, or very so rarely. Sense. So things that actually have an effect on the meaning, we're, we're talking about hundreds, like, you know, 500 maybe. Um, I mean, that's kind of a guess. I, I don't have a good sense of it. It's hard to say. And people disagree whether there's a difference in meaning, of course. So that that comes down to that as well. It's like, well, is there really a difference between that verb and that verb? Um, and, you know, uh, they, and of course, there's a real tradition trying to sort of unify these. So uh, it's it's hard to say whether there's a difference in meaning, but sometimes there really is. And so hmm. there's fewer of those still. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Okay. So we're going to talk about this, uh, and I'm going to try my best to pronounce it. <clears throat> the uh, what is the significance of the Sana manuscript or the Palmpus palm Palmpus sets? Am I saying that right? <laughs> Palim palimpsest. Palimpsest. Yes. Palimpsest. Yeah. So I have a palimpsest. Yeah. Yeah. And, so and that, it says the lower text uh, and its variants. Mm -hmm. So this is mm -hmm. a. I can bring up the the visuals when you're ready, but can you tell us what it is, and then I'll bring up some visuals. Yeah. So so the Sana palimpsest um, is one of the most exciting finds in the history of Quranic studies, basically, um, especially when it comes to to the manuscript stuff. So why? So, well, let's first talk a little bit about this. So this text was, was discovered, at least parts of it, and parts have been, been kind of coming together. And by now we have like 80 folios of the text, uh, which makes up about 40% of the full Quran. Um, it was found in the 70s uh, behind a, a kind of fake ceiling where all these Qurans were being stored. And one of them was a, was what we now call the, the, the Sana Palimpsest. So what's a Palimpsest? The Palimpsest is a text where a text where you take the parchments and parchment is very durable material so you can scratch it off quite easily or wash it off or whatever and rewrite it so you have a text you have the lower text is gone and you put a new text on basically erasing it reusing it this is very rare in quranic manuscripts we hardly ever see palimpsests uh, we have in total three of them yes i think three um but this one is the only one no that's not true the others are exciting too but this one is really exciting um yeah, this is oh. So so why is it exciting? <laughs> well, what's exciting about it is actually um, the text that was. So you have an upper text, and that's just the standard Quran, it's the Uthmani Quran. And so when I say Uthmani Quran, that means the standard text was standardized around six fifty, and it's just just a standard text, but it's a text below it. And as time progresses and some exudation happens, and you can use some stuff, you can actually see the lower text and you start reading the lower text. What's interesting about this lower text? Is it's also the Quran, um, and uh, so, but it's not the same Quran. It's not the same text because why would you remove a text and then write the exact same text over it again? That's not what happened. What happened is the text below it is a different text type. So it's not the Uthmanic text. Every single other manuscript that we have right now, um, which is hundreds of manuscripts, are all of the Uthmanic text type. All of them are part of the standard text which really shows that was a clear standardization effort at some point. Um, except for this one, this is an exception. This manuscript has slightly different wording. Um, that, that's really the difference. Um, so the verses are more or less in the same order, but the surah, so that's the chapters, are in different orders than, than we're used to. So that's interesting, that has been, been thrown about. And the wording is a little different. Uh, so every now and then um, you're like, okay, that's not, not exactly how we have it in a standard text. So that's very exciting because now we have one example of what the Quran could have looked like or did look like um, before the standardization. The standardization oh. has erased a lot of that. Uh, so we don't have much access to it. And this is one of the rare examples where we can get access to it. I'm gonna show a few examples we can go through, but I just wanna make a comment. Uh, Dr. Sean Anthony, was telling me and i don't know i can't remember if we were still recording or not but he was like mm -hmm. i was a little disappointed <clears throat> because when i got yeah. into islamic studies it, the, the quran and whatnot he was saying that he was hoping to find a like a crazy oh my gosh moment like for example when we found out that the sinful woman or the adulterous woman mm -hmm. this is interpolation or we find right. out that 
the Trinity in first John is interpolated, or we find right. out the ending of Mark wasn't really there or like, right. you know, things like that, that are like, Whoa, he was like, I was hoping we'd find something like that, but no, what we have is pretty fixed. Uh, yeah. That doesn't mean there wasn't something, but it's gone. And anyway, we'll get into all that. But yeah, I mean, yeah. So, so, so let, 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 is, is it okay if I if, if I jump off of that for a yeah, little please, bit? Yeah, um, please, please. So, so no, it's true. Uh, so you really want to have um, like 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 some really really exciting things, yeah. and even the sound of Um I mean, it's exciting in all kinds of ways, and exciting. Yeah. But it's we get excited about it because it's so rare for us to see any variants at all, right? Usually, it's just the standard text, and that's it. And here we have a text which is actually different. Um, is it massively different? No, no. It's 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 obviously Quran. Like the moment you look, it's like this is not not something else. Um, and there's not even like missing verses. I think there's like one place where where a verse is missing where the standard text has one. Uh, but other than that, it's just it's basically the same text. It's you know they they worded some things slightly differently. Um, so it it doesn't have the kind of wow effect. Even this one. Yeah. Uh, so I can see how anyone uh, could be somewhat uh, disappointed by it but you know there's other reasons to be very excited about it um, yeah i yeah. mean i think if you're finding anything at that point it's like anything's better than nothing <laughs> if you're looking for it anything's better than nothing so here's mm -hmm. our first example we have the lower text number one if you would tell us what's going on here if you don't mind and, and can you comment on this yeah, I mean, so 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 what you can see is is basically, you know, we have we have the standard text uh, on, on on the left and 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 the, and the standard text on the right, and um, in general, uh, what we see is that the wording is just a little different. Um, I mean, basically, the, the, that's what it comes down to, right? Uh, mm -hmm. There's no um, uh, there's no real you know, the, I mean, it's a bit of a difference. So, you know, it's translated here as, so keep away uh, from wives during menstruation and do not approach them until they are pure and the others. So do not get near wives during menstruation until they are pure and when they have purified themselves, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, does that have a big effect on the thing? But this is the kind of typical variance that you find. Right. Um, so you find, you know, slightly, a couple of extra words. It might be a bit wordier. It might be less wordy. Um, and these kind of things uh, are exactly what you see in, in the, in the, in the, um, so, so that's kind of what's, what's going on with it. Um, yeah. I guess one comment as we get to the next one is, do you personally think the sauna lower text, if you will, is older than the, um, Ooh, yeah, the established, you know, it, cause if, if you think it's a potentially older, um, it doesn't change too much, but it does say like, we have a fixed text. I wonder what right. was going on maybe behind this. You know, mm -hmm. maybe this is a primitive version or a. I don't know. I don't know. What is your personal opinion on this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that, that that's something I, I I think I can answer quite easily. Um, so it's very likely that it's older. Um, it it's probably written down before the standardization of the text, or it's a copy of something else uh, written down before the standardization of the text. But if we look at the radiocarbon datings of that manuscript, it may very well be uh, before canonization uh, that it was written down. Um, so that's good. I mean, it's, it's, it's very difficult to say with car carbon dating to, to be that sure, you know, we're talking about decades, um, not, not centuries. Um, so yeah, it, it really is a, a, I mean, what we probably to, to, to a biblical studies person, this would not be a different text type. It's basically the same text, right? It's, I mean, they have so many more variants that it's like, it wouldn't even occur to them to call it a different text type. But what we can say about it is that the text is not a descendant of the Othmanic text. It's not, uh, you know, we had the standard text and someone was just being a very terrible scribe. No, this is really a separate tradition. And those two separate traditions go back to an older tradition together. Um, and that older must have also been in written form. So there was some kind of kind of text from, from which these, these have descended. And uh, this text is, is just a variant of, of, of a earlier text. And it's very similar in many ways to the reports we have, which is one of the reasons why it was so exciting. Uh, we have reports of companions of the prophet who had their own codices and had differences in their wording. And well, on the one hand, it's like, okay, and this is transmitted in the, in, in the tradition. So in the Islamic tradition, they say, okay, Ibn Mas'ud used to read it like this and this, which seems to be being completely uncontroversial. Um, by, by now, some people started doubting this is really true, et cetera. Uh, but they thought it was perfectly reasonable to talk about variant readings that are not in the standard text. And, you know, and other people just had different versions of the text before standardization. 
Now, so, some people admit that and will say, yeah, but everybody came in agreement that actually the Manic text is the best thing ever made. Um, there's some reasons to doubt that. Uh, but certainly these were around. And what's interesting about it, because we have these reports, and well, of course, if you're a historian, it's like, we have these reports, but th those are not the manuscripts. Um, so do we really know whether Ibn Masoud had his text or are they just making it up to make a theological point, which has often been suggested? Um, but now we have this text, uh, the Sana Palimpsest, the lower text of the Sana Palimpsest, which is really very similar to the kinds of variants that get reported for um, for the companions. So Ibn Masoud is, mm -hmm. is one of the important companions here. Uh, he had his own codex, had differences in, in Surah order, basically, and had exactly these kinds of variants. And some of the variants even that we find in Sana Palimpsest are ones that are reported to exist for companions. And uh, it doesn't uh, fit with any specific companion. Um, so we can't say, well, the Son of Palimpsest is just Ibn Masood's codex. That's not what's happening, uh, at least if we trust those reports. Um, but it's very similar. It's so similar, in fact, that it really lends a lot of credibility to those reports as well. It really suggests, yes, there were different text types before the canonization of the text. And they kind of look like this. And basically, they look just like what we see in the Son of Palimpsest, which is really exciting. Hmm. Interesting. All right. Next example. We have uh, another one. It's a lower text. <clears throat> uh -huh. What is going on here? Can you tell us like the difference that's happening here? And if there is any, like if you, if we notice it in any of the examples I'll bring up, like anything that you drastically could point out, I think that's important. Cause I mean, at the end of the day for me, I'm just speaking as someone uh -huh. who's a skeptic who doesn't actually ontologically believe any of these religions. Right. Um, I, I still want to find, uh, let people know, like if you're a skeptic and you're watching this, you don't have to die on the hill of textual like, oh, the ha ha, see? Um, like you can look at other examples, other things that you can maybe point at and go, okay, all right, the, mm -hmm. the two-horned man, right? Like uh, this is Alexander, right? Like, uh, or you could, there's other things. I just want to point that out for people like who want to die on this hill of everything has to be, there's got to be this corruption going on in these manuscripts or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but I do want to see if there's any differences. And if they are, can you illuminate those for us? Yeah. So, um, like with this with this uh, verse, uh, once again, I mean, basically the wording is different, right? And and you know the translation. So so we get this thuma uh, azdad uh, kufr, um, which you would expect to be spelled kufran, um, uh, which is interesting. Well, there's there's, a, there's the, you'd expect an extra alif behind behind this final letter. I'm not sure if that's a typo within within the thing or or uh, like that in the sana palimpsest, which would right. be interesting in itself. Um, but anyway, so, so you know, where, where the one you want says, um, you know, uh, they disbelieved and the other one says they increased in their disbelief, um, which is, uh, well, I mean, it, like I said, I mean, it, it, yes, it's a textual variant um, and it does something to the text. Uh, it's not like, you know, they're doing something completely different, but it's, 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 it's really, uh, like you said, you know, I mean, is, is, is this really what you want to go for if you want to talk about uh, a polemics of, of the text? I don't think so. Um, and, you know, the, the other bit. So there's a bit of an extension. So there's more text there. Um, but the text doesn't, it, I mean, it's not It's not uh, like, you know, Sean Anthony said, you know, maybe a bit disappointing. It's like we're not we're not getting a total new new theology out of the text. And that's, I think, an important thing to to point out. Um, you know, the, the Sana Palimpsest is cool. It's interesting. There's all kinds of variants going on. Um, it's interesting because it gives us some sense of what, how people understood the Quran to be before the canonization, which is very difficult to get insight into um, in other ways. Mm -hmm. uh, and clearly there was, there was room for this kind of thing, right? It wasn't wrong to word a verse slightly differently um, than another person. And there are reports like this, and I think we'll talk about that later as well. Now, would you uh, say that that's an anachronistic traditional, like uh, they're imposing that idea that there can't be like, uh, yes, because exactly. there's this idea that, and correct me if I'm wrong, I've been told that the tradition has it that the angel Gabriel gives it exactly the way from Allah, and this is the eternal text, and that, like, you can't have one guy say even a slight dot right, differently, right, right. you know, and that's... Yeah, not so, 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 so it depends a lot on, I, I think, uh, I think the, the tradition itself get, gets a bit misunderstood in this, and, it, it you know, these things develop as you start polemicizing and as, you know, these things go unchallenged for longer and longer. Um, yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's not it's not a direct transcript. And, you know, one way to get out of it is like, okay, apparently uh, Gabriel uh, revealed multiple versions of the text. 
um, and and that's that's what he did. And, you know, I mean, it's 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 an angelic being. He's 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 right. um, he has the power and the power of God behind him. So of course he can do that. You know, he can he can have six mouth and, and say six different things at the same time. Um, and so I mean, it's a miracle. So so of course you can say this. Um, Anything is possible in the land. Of Anything's miracle. possible. Um, but yeah. but the thing is, clearly, there was room for slightly different versions of the text, and nobody thought this was shocking um and it's it's com completely uncontroversial uh to the, to the extent like if you look at the early early exegetes who are talking about the quran they'll say you know on this verse and here's here's some kind of interesting grammatical thing and by the way ibn masoud used to read this this verse in this way so therefore etc yeah. and and that was not not considered a problem it's just okay yeah some people read the text differently and it doesn't agree with the standard text and that's the way it goes um and you know they they believed in the authority of those companions that 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 it was acceptable. Um, so there's this that kind of thing going on with this. Um, so yeah, I mean if you say yeah, sure it's it's a direct transcript of how 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 the prophet heard it. Yeah, I mean, maybe um, I don't know. <laughs> it, it's just it's just no way no way to say. Um, awesome. But yeah, basically that. Okay, I'll do our our final one on the sana uh, the pal palimpus. <laughs> <laughs> Palimpsest <laughs> manuscript. Here we yeah. go. So uh, this is lower text as well. And uh, what do you see happening here? Is there any potential drastic change here in some sense? I mean, or I mean, uh, so so I, I, uh, this one is kind of kind of drastic, right? Um, right. You know, and the translation just seems fine. So so one thing that's kind of interesting, and this is very typical, um, is the final word is different. Um, so you get. Uh, in, in the modern Quranic text, you get uh, al-muhtadin, and in the Sana, you apparently get uh, al-muflihin. Um, you know, that's the rightly guided or the successful or whatever. Um, both of them rhyme, and it is a typical kind of thing that you would see in kind of um, oral performance, right? Where it's like, okay, well, we need to get to a rhyme. Uh, let me come up with a word that will rhyme here just nicely and fine, and let's put it in there. And um, that's very typical in a kind of, you know, and this is kind of what we need to think about in 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 um, in the early pre-colonization time. Probably people wrote some stuff down, but they also memorized a lot, and they did it from memory or semi-memory and these kinds of things. And apparently you could, you know, switch out the rhyme word in these kinds of cases. Like, okay, no, that, that works just fine. I'll do that. Um, and that's interesting, and and you can do something about it, and it kind of reveals that. So that's an interesting part. And the other part is like, okay, yeah, no, it's actually saying something slightly differently, and ultimately, you know, um, whether whether uh, it is talking about what was it jihad or a salat and zakat, I think. Uh, yeah. Right. What is the difference there? What is give zakat I mean, and what is jihad? Um, well, that's so I so open up a can is, of worms. No, huh? I mean it's not. No. Um, so you know, uh, establish. Prayer and get zakat. So zakat is is alms, right? So you uh -huh. you 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 do things uh, and do jihad uh, in the name of Allah. I, I mean, yes, those are very different things. The way we understand jihad is, of course, a question. You know, it's it's struggle in some way, um, which either means you know you know actual, actual violent and military struggle or uh, some other sense. And we don't have enough context to really make sense of what it means here. But it's clearly saying something differently. Is is establishing the prayer and, and and giving zakat is is that jihad? I don't know. Um, I don't know. It's it, that's uh, that, that's an interesting question. A question for for uh, theologians, I think, to figure yeah. out whether you could see it that way. But basically, I mean, those are different things, and that's you know a pretty significant variant. I think it's interesting. I mean, for me, I've, and I don't know jack squat compared to you guys when it comes to it. But uh, when Dr. Sean Anthony talks about these early concepts and ideas, even from the enemies of Muhammad, mm -hmm. who speak of him in this sense of like, you know, the uh, Jacob doctrine of Jacob, if you will, talk about mm -hmm. he's going to bloodshed and that he's got the keys to paradise. Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds like an early rise of an empire that is definitely out here and, and that jihad is associated with that. If mm -hmm. the if the Sana manuscript is earlier, mm -hmm. I wondered if for mm -hmm. whatever reason we're not in a conquest we're not conquesting here in this particular concept we want prayer and zakat we we're mm -hmm. not interested in uh well right so, so we'll be the other way around right uh, because i think i think i think the jihad one is the one that it's in the sana palimpsest mm -hmm. um 
So yeah, that's what it, I mean. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Exactly. So yeah, I, I, I guess. But but it's like well, the conquests were also still going on, and you know, by the time that the Othmanic text was uh, okay. was established, so Got it's it. not. Um, so, 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 you know, it's, it's hard to say whether they're doing something in, in, in that sense. Um, yeah. you know, I mean, they, they continued with that. So it was not, not, there was a, say a, a anti-conquest, um, agenda for, for, uh, for Afman, uh, Afman, you know, just continued, uh, conquest, right. uh, more important than, than Muhammad, of course, even. So, um, yeah, so, you know, it, it kind of makes you wonder, okay, well, why is that variant there? It's really quite different and I, I wonder i wonder how people would interpret that i'm not yeah. sure yeah maybe maybe down the road i could get your thoughts on it because i i mm -hmm. definitely see a lot of apocalypticism as i said in judaism christianity mm -hmm. and in the seventh century with jewish right. and christian thought so yeah. here we have this rise of an apocalyptic movement and i and jihad seems to be associated with apocalypticism mm -hmm. in some sense based on what i heard from dr anthony so it makes me kind of wonder if like they're right. getting i don't know it's, it's just so many ideas okay mm -hmm. next question we're talking about variants. Are there any significant meaning changes due to any of the variants? And if you want, I can go ahead and jump into an example. But yeah, what are some significant so, ones since you said there are very few. Yeah, so so we'll jump in a couple. I think so. Uh, we'll talk about that. But I mean, there are meaning differences, and every now and then they are reconcilable, and sometimes they're not. And um, I think it's 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 probably reasonable and you should be trying to reconcile them in some way um if, if that's that's a possibility but every now and then um they don't and the question is okay well are they significant um so and and that really depends on on of course your theology um your understanding and what, what you call significant um so there's a famous one and this with the is is the you know the enunciation that that um Mary is going to be pregnant and get a child, and uh, the angel comes down and says, "You know, uh, I have been sent by the Lord in order to give you that I give you a pure son, or that He gives you a pure son." Um, and there's kind of an interesting thing going on there. Is that I give you, uh, He gives you. It's like okay, so He gives you, which doesn't actually work with the standard text, but some of the readers still read it that way. Um, is that in order to avoid the suggestion that this angel himself will be impregnating Mary? Um, you know, there, there seems to be some kind of theological motivation there. Of course, you, say, you can also say, well, no, he's just, you know, being, being, uh, and it is also a reasonable and accepted reading. Um, he's just announcing, you know, I'll be, I'll be giving you a child through the power of God, no problem. Um, you know, there's no real impregnating going on anyway. Um, so you can see how they would avoid a reading like that, but it's both of them are completely canonical. They are both probably saying the same thing. And I don't think the wording of I will give you a, a, a pure son um, is trying to suggest that that uh, the angel is doing the impregnating or these kinds of things, right? That's just how you could interpret it. But pretty sure the Quran didn't intend that, you know, the text of the Quran, or the composer of the Quran intended that, that to be the case. Um, it's pretty clear that, you know, power comes from God and that kind of thing. It's just one way you might make it a little clearer than the other way. Right. Um, so that, that, that's a nice example of, you know, a pretty significant variant. Um, and uh, yeah, basically that. I've got some more we can get into if you don't mind. Right. Uh, get your yeah, thoughts sure. on. So, all right, here's one variant. Yeah. What do you see so happening? This is a very famous one. Um, so, because uh, it's very nice. It's a very long um, verse. And it talks about how to perform ritual prayer, well, how to perform the ablutions before that. So, you know, your, the washing of yourself. Um, and then you have this one word um, which only differs in a single vowel. So that's arjulakum and arjulikum. Um, and it's really interesting, like sometimes even, so it, it, it mentions here Hafsan Susi, Susi is the transmitter of Abu Amr, but even the um, uh, the other transmitter, um, so 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 say the the co-student of Hafs uh, Shaba reads it differently from Hafs. Hafs is the stand uh, well, is the most recited version of the text right now, um, and uh, he he transmits from from Asim. Um, and what it comes down to, it's it, it's kind of a a a small grammatical detail uh, where the case changes of the word, 
which makes it unclear or so basically one thing is we cannot see since it's a vowel and you don't write vowels you cannot see this difference in the written text so if you have the arithmetic text this is genuinely ambiguous the only way that you can know is when someone someone taught you which one or two it is mm. i think you can make a case that one is maybe more probable than the other but the point is what it comes down to is whether you should be um, washing or wiping your feet uh, well, so do you just wipe them or do you actually wash them with, with a full thing? And, you know, these things come down to, to sectarian differences. I always forget which one is Rooks. Um, <laughs> but anyway, it comes down to the Sunni and Shi difference in, in how to do the uh, ablutions. So, you know, that, that's a significant difference. And, and it, it's just a tiny thing, just a tiny vowel, and it changes everything. Um, wow. So that's the thing that can happen. Thank you. Thank you. Up to another example. Right. Yeah. Um, so here we get, you know, Sahrani uh, or Sahrani, which indeed translates to something like two works of magic, two, two magics, um, uh, or two pieces of magic uh, supporting each other, or two magicians. Uh, so, you know, um, there are two magicians. Well, which one is it? Um, so what, what's kind of interesting about this, uh, I, I suppose, and you get this every now and then with these readings, is it's, it's in direct speech, you know, and if direct speech is supposed to be um, transmitting what people, historical people or figures actually said, it's like, okay, which one did they say? Uh, and sometimes you get very absurd solutions um, where where modern Muslims try to harmonize. He's like, well, they said both. They just said it both in a row, which is obviously not what happened. Um, <laughs> it's like, no, it's one of the two. And both of them are close enough, right? He, he's meaning that yeah, this does yeah, not yeah. Totally change the meaning of the text. Um, but it's but it's but they are different and they mean something differently and they're technically irreconcilable if you assume that they are both direct transcripts of a real historical event in that sense right and it, that's not what it's about it's about it's it's about the um the 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 truth of the meaning of the text and not the truth of of, of the event of the text right that's not what it's talking about it's using the the, the event in order to 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 tell something and that point is made, you know, is basically brought across regardless of how you read it. You know, and this so this reminds, I was going to say, mm -hmm. this reminds me of how Orthodox Christians, Eastern, you know, Roman mm -hmm. Catholic and whatnot, view inspiration versus others uh, who mm -hmm. view inspiration. And their definition of what inspiration means is different. So one uh -huh. is demanding reconciliation and harmonization no matter what it is. I can I could show you, like, and I'm using the Bible as an example, right? Where Jesus is saying, go to Galilee, wait for me. Luke and John do not say Galilee. They say, go to Jerusalem. And then what a Christian will do later is go, oh, no, no, no. They first went to Galilee, but then they went to Jerusalem. And it's like they, they can't – no, you, these aren't reconcilable. Right. But it's like it, – I guess if you're going to have that kind of requirement on what you expect to harmonize and mm -hmm. be inspiration by your definition, well, mm -hmm. no, scholarship is going to come out. So I think you're pointing out scholars and even practicing Muslim scholars are mm -hmm. recognizing – and this is not like a – this is not a death no, blow. This is not and something. So, so I, I think I think it's very important to point this out. Actually, uh, what you're saying is, um, if you look at the exegetes, so the medieval exegetes, when when they are commenting on these kinds of things, where where two things can technically not be true at the same time, that that doesn't bother them. They just say, okay, well, this means this and this means that, and it it, it, it doesn't even occur to them to start talking about, okay, well, apparently there's a contradiction here. Um, <laughs> No, this, is, right. this means this and this means that. And the, they'll sometimes say, well, I think this reading makes more sense. Um, without saying the other one is bad, they might, they, 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 they just, you know, it's like, okay, I think this is more fitting. Um, and, and sometimes they will say something is bad. I mean, I'm sure they wouldn't with this one because it's so insignificant. But, but it's like it didn't, didn't seem to indeed not bother them that that was a, a contradiction. Uh, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't contradictory to them. And, um, and you see that that, that is, at least for some um, uh, Muslims now, uh, changing, and they do want to reconcile this and do want to understand this, and I think it's a it's a it's probably a a, a result uh, of the modern times where we have a very I, I don't know well I mean the, 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 it sometimes comes off as a kind of kind of Christian envy who have also you know <laughs> bent over backwards to to get rid of certain certain things and you're like I mean let let's not do this I mean it seems seems perfectly reasonable to to not you know just deal with with these things and it's like okay 
is Jesus any any less divine to a Christian if if you know these these events are not perfectly exact? No, of course not. And mm -hmm. the same is true for the Quran. Um, so well put. Yeah, that, yeah. That, that's kind of how I think about that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I, I'm totally on board with you because that's the church for well over a thousand years well over i mean maybe mm -hmm. even more i mean 1500 you know this wasn't an issue i think protestantism came in and it caused more of a uh we need to we need to get back to the text and everything has to be like you know so anyway final example of variant that that we have mm -hmm. here yeah oh this is an interesting one um so yeah a couple of examples here and this is this is typical um so what we get here is is a verb Kala, which means he said, which may also be read as kul, uh, which means say. Mm. And, um, well, as you can see in these translations, which I quite like, is they, they, they found a way to get around that, right? Either the prophet said or um, say, O oh, Muhammad, uh, and basically you're doing the same thing, right? It means exactly the same thing. The thing is, this is a place where the text is ambiguous. So in the earliest manuscripts, um, whenever you write Kala, which means he said, you read it exactly the same as Qul. They're indistinguishable from each other. And as a result, you see that one reader, if, if both readings make sense, I mean, the vast majority of the time, only Qala makes sense. Uh, and you're like, okay, well, there's no doubt that it just means he said. And uh, a vast majority of the times, uh, Qul only makes sense, say. Uh, but every now and then you come in a, in a context where like, well, I guess both readings would work and both readings come to be. Uh, and then you indeed end up with Hafs reading Qala and, and what's reading Qul. And that's basically basically what, what is happening. Um, but that seems that seems to be an in interpretational thing. Um, uh, and Muslims would often say, yeah, no, both of these versions were revealed, um, but it's clearly stemming from a ambiguity in the text where that ambiguity in the text wasn't there when it was being said or you know being, being whispered into the ear. It's there because the scripts cannot distinguish these two words, um, so you don't. And you're like, okay, well, it could be either. I, I, I guess it can read them in both ways. And it wasn't spelt with that on purpose. That's also something you hear a lot. You know, spelled with that on purpose in order to accommodate both. No, it's just that's the way you spelled it. It's, you know, just like um, I don't know. Uh, I'm trying to think of an English analogy or something like that. You know, just like how you write enough with a GH at the end, which is an insane thing to do, but this is how you spell it and that's how you're supposed to do it. You know, and it's, it just happens to be a very strange reading uh, with an F at the end. Um, so, so, so that's kind of what, what what's going on with these. So there's clearly, there's clearly, and, and this, this happens with, with the readings. Every now and then it's, you're like, well, obviously this reading is being, being generated by the text and they are looking at the text and like, okay, I could read this in two ways. Both of them make good sense to me, and one person came to a different conclusion than the other. And um, and every now and then you're like, well, these words are nothing alike, um, <laughs> but they are spelled exactly the same because of the amb ambiguities of, uh, of the scripts. So um, a famous one is you get fatabayano and fatathabato, which uh, are you know words that are just completely dotted differently, but the dots aren't there. So they sound different they're very different words but you could read them both written down clearly the, the written form is what's primary here not the pronounced form and um since there was no written form of the text when the revelation was supposed to happen th these can't both be revelation in that sense um and muslims tend to have different intuitions about that um so you know you're like no no look it's clearly based on the text, and they're like, "Well, no, I, you know, that that's just part of the miracle, and it can be part of the miracle. It's just, you know, I mean, a miracle is not something we can work with if we want to say something about the history of the text." That's true. I mean, when you're working his in, with historical data, yeah, that's that that's an interesting point about miracles. All right, so I've got some questions here, mm -hmm. and then I have a few examples if we have time to just ask briefly mm -hmm. at the end. So I'm going to try and get through these with you. There's a lot here. What exactly is the dialect of the Quran? And is mm. that is that the dialect Muhammad was speaking in? Historians say some Arabic pronunciations are lost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, so so basically this this is gonna be my new book. Um <laughs> so 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 there's a couple of interesting questions here. So first of all, we have 
the Quran, and there are now, so first there were seven canonical reading traditions and three more were added, and basically everyone is in agreement, those 10 are have, have authority. And then there's a couple of more that people disagree about, but basically nobody actually disagrees, it's those 10. And those 10 are linguistically different from one another um, in all kinds of, you know, grammatical ways, or most importantly, pronunciation ways, which is to say, you know, one word might be pronounced differently from one to the other. Um, just to give you an example, um, uh, so the world, uh, a dunya is pronounced by some as a dunye. So the word means exactly the same thing, you're pronouncing it differently. So which of the two is the correct one? Uh, that's one question. If any, uh, could be, you know, if they're disagreeing with each other, which one is it? And I think it's very reasonable to assume that, you know, when, when, when um, the prophet uh, recited the Quran, he um, presumably did that in a language that people could actually understand. So that's one thing. And um, and presumably the local dialect, that's, that's I, I think, is to be expected. The question is, of course, we need to test that hypothesis because that's not actually a popular opinion, uh, even uh, among Western scholars. Um, so, so we have these readings and they are linguistically irreconcilable. And what's interesting about them is they are even irreconcilable within themselves. So what people very often say with the readings, like, well, they're just dialects. Well, they're not, they really are not. We have very good descriptions from medieval grammarians who say this tribe says it like this and this and this, and this other tribe does it that way, that way, and that way, and that way. And not a single one of the canonical readers follows any of those patterns. So we actually have a good idea what, for example, the dialect of the Hijaz, so that's the region where, where uh, Muhammad had his prophecy, basically. Um, nothing looks like that dialect over there. They are all mixed with all kinds of different things. So every now and then you get a form and that's, you know, typically Hijazi. And then you get another thing that is typically non Hijazi. And they both show up sometimes even within a single word. And oh, wow. if you would follow follow the descriptions of the grammarians, you're like, well, I could read this word in like these five different ways. In this dialect, you would read it like this. In this dialect, you'd read it like this. In this dialect, you'd read it like this. And not a single one is the actual pronunciation that we have in the Quran. Um, so it's it's being mixed from all kinds of different places. Now, the question is, to what extent is that being mixed? Is that part of the, say, the performance register that kind of develops over time, which is what I would say is the case? And to what extent is that was that part of the character of, of the language of the Quran itself? So the, the language of revelation, so to speak. And uh, many scholars think that, you know, there was a kind of kind of high culture language, which was this kind of weird mixed thing that people used in poetry and also used to compose the Quran. Um, and I say, well, you know, there's something, that's something we can test. That, that's a testable hypothesis. Why the Quran is very uh, helpfully written in rhyme. So, I come at this as a linguist, um, which is not a background many people in, in, in Quranic studies have. So I'm like, okay, well, I mean, that's very obvious. I mean, that's how we've always shown, you know, for example, to figure out how Shakespeare in English sounded and how that sounded different from us is by looking at his rhyme. We can see from the rhyme that he pronounced certain words differently than we do today. Right. And we can reconstruct what it sounded like. So you do this. Uh, and let's take the example, uh, Dunier, for example, that I just mentioned. Um, so you get this difference between vowels, the A and the A vowel, which some of the readers have, and then other readers do not have that. So some readers have more vowels than other readers. And we can look at the rhyme because those words show up in rhyme. And what we see is that words that are pronounced with A can only be pronounced with A, which clearly shows that that was a different sound from the A and that you're supposed to pronounce it dunye. So you can kind of look at the rhyme and say, okay, we can reconstruct what it sounded like. Now, not every single word sends in rhyme, of course, so we cannot completely know every single aspect of pronunciation, but we can really learn a, a couple of things. And once you start doing that, if you start looking, okay, what shows up in rhyme? How are words actually spelled where people say, well, these are differences between dialects. What we get, and we make this list is okay. So not looking at what the reading traditions do, because the reading traditions sometimes just break rhyme because of these kinds of things. But what does the text actually tell us? What can they kind of tell us from the spelling? What can it tell us from the rhyme? And if you start doing that, you learn something very nice. Because what you get every single time when there's a place where we could check it in the text, so not on the reading tradition, but purely check it from the text, every single time the linguistic features that we find there are associated with Hejaz. 
uh, and specifically even the, the tribe of the Quraysh, which was the, the tribe of uh, Muhammad, every single time, which suggests to me that the Quran was not written down or even you know uh, revealed in some uh, poetic language uh, that all the Arabs were able to speak and com compose a poetry in. No, it was written in the local vernacular, which makes very good sense um, yeah. because, you know, people want to hear the revelation. And the Quran even goes out of his way to make this point. It says, look, our revelation is in in uh, in uh, Lisan Arabi, that is in the Arabic language, uh, so that you may understand the clear Arabic language. Uh, clearly, and it's even saying, and it's not foreign, clearly making, I, I would say, and this is this isn't a thought, not, not by me, but uh, uh, written up by Ahmed Al-Jalad, who said, look, um, it is not saying this text is in a magical poetic language that people use. No, it's saying it is in a vernacular, unlike the Bible, which is in Aramaic or Greek, right? Unlike uh, the Hebrew Bible, which is in Hebrew. Um, this text is actually one you can actually understand. So, you know, when I start speaking this text and tell you about these things, you can hear directly what it means. Um, I think that that is very good. And I think that is right. If you actually look at the text, that's what you see. What's more, more interesting even, there's traditions and pretty good traditions uh, of the early compilation of the Uthmanic texts where a couple of the people are in disagreement with each other how they're supposed to write a certain word. Um, and then they go to Uthman and say, like, okay, what should we be doing? And he says, look, you need to write down the, the, the Quran in the dialect of the Quraysh, because that is how it was revealed. Well, if that's true, like, assuming that's true, which yeah, yeah. I, I think is true actually in this case, but um, if that's true, that's not what people are reciting today. What they're reciting today absolutely is not the dialect of the Quraysh at all. Um, so clearly something changed. The language that the Quran is recited in has indeed been changed to something much closer to like the language of poetry and these kinds of things. But it seems to have originally been composed and written down in the dialect of Quraysh. Wow. Okay, <laughs> you really put some light bulbs off in my head too. And I wondered if, and I was thinking about biblical studies, right? Because I, I try to relate because I see... Mm -hmm similarities in the way that right. historians are doing this but also how religions and these texts are built people for example are allegorizing things and i think they're doing so because they don't want the original to be as ugly and like mm -hmm. and you see this happen a lot but i wonder right. in linguistic terms if this plays a significant role as to why they've oh this magical text so now mm -hmm. it's it's a magical language that is so, it's ambiguous and it requires some other uh Thing for you to understand it so that they mm. can have an interpretation that suits what they want in contemporary times to fit their mm -hmm. idea. I don't know. Is that something? Yeah. So, so, so it's, it's, it's not so strongly that. I mean, it's very much a linguistic thing. So it doesn't have, it ha doesn't have that, that effect. The effect it does have, of course, is, is in, to some extent recitation of the Quran becomes a job, right? This is something right. you do. Um, and it's something you can be good at. It's something people can find beautiful. And what you will do, especially uh, as um, you know, the Islamic era progresses, uh, poetry starts having a incredible um, prestige and open up any book. It doesn't need, it, it could be about the driest thing you can think of and you, you would think this has nothing to do with poetry ever. Yeah. You open it up and any book is full of poetry. You open up histories, uh, Arabic histories, poetry. You open up, I don't know, a book about the precise pronunciation of the Quran, you'll find poetry. Um, and, and that's very dry material. I think it's very interesting, but it's incredibly dry. Um, and, and poetry is there. It's everywhere. And so I would say, so the prestige of, of this kind of poetic language becomes very, very high and develops over time. Like, what is the way to do it? And that's what we call classical Arabic today. And, you know, these, this poetry has incredible prestige. And then there's the crown, which is supposed to be the best book best piece of literature ever written. I mean, that's, that's what, what Muslims believe. And, right. and that's somehow in some weird, um, you know, local vernacular uh, from, from the Hejaz. No, of course not. It should be in a poetic language. It's like poetry because it's the best language there is. And that seems to have kind of affected and you know, people who were good at this. So many, many reciters were also grammarians. al Kisai is famous um, as both a reciter uh, and a grammarian. And they 
part of part of their job to be a good reciter is to use this kind of language and make these kind of choices and do exotic things with the language. And they're really doing that. You can see them play, play around with this. Uh, famous is, for example, Hafsa, the, 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 the most common uh, transmitter of, of uh, the most common reading today. Um, he has a couple of words which he will read the same way every time for like 200 times, except one time where he'll read the word slightly differently, only pronunciation, but only once, which has absolutely no function except that to just show off, hey, I know that you can read it like this too, check it out, I know it. And, you know, it's part of kind of, part of the, 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 the play of the language and that's what they're doing. So they're really playing around with this language and trying to make it more beautiful and figuring out how to make it beautiful. Um, and really interacting and showing off their prowess in this um, classical Arabic language and what they can do with it and how they understand it, how many how many good details they know. Um, so th that's kind of what's going on with the language. Hmm. Oh, there's a lot there. <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay. So does anyone even know what does Ahruf mean? Can no. you elaborate on the 40 different <laughs> opinions? <laughs> yes, yes. Well, I'm not going to elaborate on all 40 of them. But, right. Uh, just... No, no, no. no but but, but, but it, it, it's an important point. Um, so I'll, I'll tell a little bit about this. So this is a famous hadith um, about the Prophet. And there's a couple of different versions of this, but what it basically always comes down to is the Prophet. Um, so, so a couple of people, companions of the Prophet, are reciting the Quran and they come into conflict because they're reciting it differently. And they go to the Prophet and they're like, well, this guy is, you know, reciting in this way. I'm reciting it this way. What, what's right? And in both cases, you know, that that's how it was revealed. And they're like, okay, what does that mean? How is that possible? How can it be revealed? And he says, well, the Quran was revealed in seven ahruf. So ahruf is the plural of harf, um, which in normal Arabic, I would say, means word or letter. So seven letters, seven words. Neither of those make much sense, uh, so that can't be the right meaning. It can also mean edge, which doesn't make sense either. So that can't be it. But the intended meaning is, I think, pretty obvious, is there was variation. I mean, assuming that, that the prophet actually said this, which I'm willing to go on a limb of probably true. I mean, it's a very, very widespread uh, tradition, which is really, really ancient. Um, so, um, so you go all the way. Um, Sorry, I, I got distracted for a second. Oh yeah, so uh, so it's, it's a very ancient ancient tradition, and it's clearly about disagreement about how you should be reciting the text. Now, we have Salah palimpsest. We can see that there can be these differences in meaning. Like in general, the text is, is sort of the same, um, but there is nevertheless something going on uh, where people can choose slightly different differences, and they probably ran into those. Like, okay, what's going on with this? How is this possible? And he just says, well. Clearly, you can make some variation. And then, OK, what does this harf mean? Uh, and what does this seven mean? So there's a question, is it exactly seven? Or is seven a magical number? And I think, you know, uh, with your background in Christianity, uh, you'll be ready to say, no, that's probably a magical number. Right. Um, but a lot yeah. of people try to make it a exactly seven um, in these in these many opinions. Some of them have said it's seven dialects. And then other people said, no, that doesn't make any sense, because these people are arguing with each other over the contents of the text are both Qurayshi, so they would be speaking the same dialect. So, you know, why would they be disagreeing on this? Um, so that can't be it. Uh, but it's a very popular opinion. You still hear it a lot today, uh, despite it being very obviously wrong. Um, but what's seven clearly... layers, seven heavens, seven earths. Right. There's exactly. so many. Yeah. 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 It sounds more so, mythological, so, but. Yes. So, so, so to me, clearly, it, it's, it's not a literal number, but it is clearly about. People recite the Quran in different ways, and all of that is fine as long as you don't screw up the meaning of the text. And they, that's even what some of the versions have this, like, don't mix up a, a verse of uh, wrath with, with a verse of grace and these kinds of things. So you shouldn't, you shouldn't be mixing up the wording if it doesn't make sense anymore. Um, so that's kind of what it comes down to. It has something to do with this kind of oral period of the Quran where not everything was written down in a standardized text and people were disagreeing on what exactly the text should be. And the answer was, well, actually, it's allowed to be all of those things. So it's a very different kind of um, approach to kind of, you know, we tend to think of very literal and literalist texts and, you know, we're very much uh, thinkers in books, right? And books right. Are cha don't change and these kinds of things. And... 
That wasn't the case. Uh, the text was an oral performance, was an oral text, uh, at least to some extent. And it was okay to have this kind of variation, maybe even part of part of you know what it was to be that text. And that changes once it gets canonized, where less room is possible for these for these differences. Wow. All right. So then uh, leads me to the next question. Do you think the Qur'an was burned to eliminate the growing variance in the empire, that that expansion taking place? Yeah. What do you so, think? So, so the burning thing that pe people really, really like this um, in, 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 in polemical circles and th this reports, I mean, this reports to say burn the Quran and, and it, it's a very strange kind of thing to argue about because Muslims go, yeah, of, of course it were burned because now we had a standard text and, you know, everybody agreed that that was going to be the standard text. So it's a very kind of strange polemical conversation to have, which, which is very um, asymmetrical because Muslims don't see an issue with burning in the text. <laughs> Uh, and polemicists too, and so, you know, what do you do with that? But the question of the historicity of that story. Um, the, the issue, of course, is if you start burning Qurans, you can't find them. Um, so it's it's hard to say whether whether Uthman burned them, but we can say a couple of things. We basically only have the standard text. There's no other text variants around at all, which seems to suggest if there were lots of them around, they have disappeared. Were there lots of them around? We don't know. But if there were, they have disappeared. What we can see is that the Sana palimpsest. I mean, we do have a different text type there, but it's been erased off, right? It has not been burned, right. but it's, it's, it's been destroyed. And the standard text has been written over it, which clearly shows, I mean, someone thought, okay, this text is not good anymore, at least for this one, this one sample. This text isn't good anymore. We should have the proper text on here. Erase the, the old text and put the new one over. Wouldn't it be more well, practical it, for them to erase it because of the cost of papyri and such? Right. Well, yes. So parchment, I should say, not papyri. Parchment, but, sorry, uh, sorry. Parchment, yeah. Oh, which is incredibly expensive, right? Right. Um, so when you when you take parchment, you know, you have to kill animals and you have to kill hundreds of animals sometimes to to, to get these things. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's much better to 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 get it off and just write it over, and that's why people did it. And it's actually close to a miracle that we've only found three of these. Apparently, they really did not like doing this um, with the Quran. And actually, one of the three Palam says the Quran has been erased and a Christian text has been written over it. So that's not even comparable. Uh, it's, wow. you, it's, yeah, it makes you wonder, it's like, what exactly was the social context where you could erase a really ancient Quranic manuscript and start writing Christian text over it um, in the Islamic world? It's, it's very strange. Yeah. Uh, and the other one is, is a Bible that has been erased and the Quran has been written over it, the standard text of the Quran. Um, so, so they didn't didn't like palimpsesting. At least that's that's what we can see so far. Uh, they really didn't mind slaughtering a whole bunch of sheep to make the crown, which says something about their devotion to the text, I think. Um, but uh, where was I going with this? So um, about burning. So yeah, so were they burned? I don't know. Maybe. Um, but it, it seems at least this one sample that we have, we see someone who clearly felt, okay, no, the text has become. There's, there's, there's a new standard text now, and we should use that. So something probably happened, and there probably was some kind of decree, okay, you have to follow this text now. Whether he actually had the other ones burned, we don't know, but we have reports quite late. Um, so uh, al Farra, who is a student of al Kisa'i, the reader, and a famous grammarian from Kufa, he writes at the end of the second Islamic century, and he still gives eyewitness reports of what was in the Mus'haf, of, uh, so in the Codex of Ibn Mas'ud. Um, so clearly, he, he had a copy and he could look at it. And this is 150 years after uh, Othman supposedly burnt them all. So if he burnt them, he failed, basically. Hmm. Right? So that's kind of what you what you what you end up with. Okay, there were clearly some copies around, even though we don't have them anymore today. I don't think all these authorities were lying about that. There's no reason for them to lie about it that they saw it in in this mushaf or the other. So no, yeah. It, it, on those copies, just quickly, um, were, was it like drastically different? And this is why there there's a suggestion to burn them. I mean, no, well, well, we don't we don't know. We don't know. Um, yeah, that's the um, thing. But but the, what we have is reports of what the companion codices looked like, and those are not drastically different. And we have the Sana palimpsest, which is also not drastically different. It's right. different, but anyone who would read that would see it's the Quran and most people will probably not realize they're not looking at the standard text if they haven't actually memorized it. 
Got it. Um, so, you know, it's like if, if, if you're like, oh, here's the Quran, and nobody will go, this is not the Quran. Um, you know, they'll go, yes, this is obviously a Quran. It's just not the Quran that we have today. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Awesome. So, what is the magnitude of variance between companion codices, Ibn Masud mm -hmm. versus Ube mm -hmm. versus mm -hmm. Zayed? For example, whole chapters missing according to each? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's that's a good question. Um, once again, difficult to say. Um, so what we have are reports of where they differ. And we have absolutely no reason to think that those lists are complete. Uh, but they're pretty long, and they really do record a lot of variants. Uh, you know, for Ibn Masoud especially, I mean, I think we have hundreds, hundreds of variants being recorded. And I mean, it's hard to say um, whether they... Um, whether that's 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 complete that's all of it because if it's all of it it's really not that much um but if it's only a fraction of the differences then it's quite a lot uh, it could be a lot right mm -hmm. um and so there are a couple of other things is yeah um let me get this right so even masoud considered the last two surahs and the first surah of fatiha to not be part of the quran and apparently did not have it in his codex that's what's reported Ubay is, is, is it Ubay? I think so, uh, is said to have two extra surahs. And those have come down to us. Um, they haven't come down to us as a Quran, but they are in the literary sources. And uh, Sean Anthony has written a wonderful article um, showing all the variants that are being transmitted, but they're, they're two surahs and they're kind of prayers. And many people go, like, no, this is not Quran, they're clearly prayers. But I think the only reason why we think they're clearly prayers is because they're not in the Quran. If they have been in the Quran, everybody has said, yes, obviously it's the Quran. They're not just prayers that aren't supposed to be part of the text. Um, I think that's Sean Anthony's opinion too, but I'd have to check. Um, yeah. But other people disagreed. I mean, there, there's also Western scholars who said, no, this clearly isn't part of the Quran. Um, this is nonsense. And uh, for stylistic reasons, and I, I just haven't found them very compelling. I they, they look like Quran to me, but they're not in the current text. So at least someone at some point thought this is obviously not the Quran. Um, so, you know, every now and then people people tell me, like, you know, uh, obviously this is not part of, part of the Quran uh, because, you know, it's, it doesn't look anything like it. And like, well, clearly someone agreed with you because they're not there anymore. Um, so Uthman apparently shared this opinion. Um, so, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe it's true. Um, so those are, those are, I mean, that's pretty major, I would say, uh, missing chapters, uh, if those were actually ever present, uh, but they haven't been removed after the standardization, right? So there was a standardization effort and those two were removed right away. And a fat house added right away. There was no difference there. They also had difference in Suda orders. They had difference in wording within these texts. Uh, but that, that's kind of what's going on there. So yeah, I mean, it's a bit of a controversial point. Uh, there seems to be two things that get taken away, but they, they're prayers and they do very little for the theology of the text. These, these are not not the kind of variants where um, that, you know, get, get people working on, on, on the New Testament get all excited with, you know, whole parts just added, which really have some real significant meaning. It's like, no, they, they, these are some kind of prayers and they, they add to the text, but they don't, they don't radically change how we understand certain passages. Interesting. Thank you. All right. Uh, do any uh, Mutawatir Kiryat uh, deviate from the Uthmanic Razm? Yes, they do. Um, so, well, first of all, Uthmanic Razm, we'll, we'll go over that word for a second. Uh, so this is the consonantal text. Okay. And when Uthman standardized the text, he had a standard text, right? With every single consonant basically spelled out, and that hasn't really changed much. And the readers started following that. I mean, that was part of the thing. It's like, okay, you have a standard text and everybody can just start reciting whatever they want. That's not something they did. So people who are from pre-Othmanic times and then came in contact with the Othmanic text had to start adapting their reading if it was different from the Othmanic text, which for many of them it must have been because they didn't have that text, adapting that reading and start reading what it actually said. Now, Ibn Mas'ud famously opposed this um, and just continued reciting his own thing. It's like, my Quran is perfectly fine. Why do, would I be doing this one? Um, but as this line progresses and as uh, centuries progress, people start doing it. They start following the text. And every single canonical reader that we have today essentially follow the standard text. However, they do sometimes deviate. And very, very tiny points. Um, so there's a, there's a famous one in Surah Taha where the text, this gets a bit uh, a, a bit technical, but we'll, we'll, we'll do it anyway. 
we get uh, which is uh, these are not but, um, but two uh, sorcerers and the word these two hadani should have been from a classical Arabic grammatical point of view should have been hadani uh, with a ya in the middle which you would write differently which would change the text uh, so it looks like a grammatical error um, and it's been called a grammatical error in the tradition it's really interesting so it's a code uh, it's a codified grammatical error yes kind of like um, can, I, can i give one example biblically to kind of get our audience yeah. to see what i'm saying so the the psalms 22 famous passage you know where it talks about my god my god why have you forsaken me there's this part where the the it seems like the gospel author when they're looking at my hands and my feet pierced mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. piercing if you go back to the septuagint the greek translator of the hebrew makes a, a what looks like a grammatical either mistake or something mm -hmm. potentially has a different meaning it means like a lion at my hands and my feet not pierced mm -hmm so to speak. Right. Some argue right. it means Doug or this and that, but there are people who think, no, this is a codified that has been canonized grammatical mm -hmm. error that the author of the New Testament, inspired perfectly by the all-knowing, I'm just mm -hmm. teasing around when I say mm -hmm. that, but the point is he's working off of a text that is codified and it's it's got some mistake that doesn't right. match the, the Masoretic or the Hebrew. So right. I just wanted to like throw that out there. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so it's, it's, it's very comparable. And, and of course, I mean, actually have looked at this and like, no, look, this is, in some dialects you can say it like this and there's other solutions and, and there's all kinds of ways to do it. Um, but one of the canonical readers, Abu Amr, who was also a grammarian and that probably says something about why he went for this reading, he fixed the reading. He was like, no, no, this is clearly ungrammatical. I'm going to read this at Havani and the, the Rasan be damned. And he so he ignores the Rasan goes with what he thinks is grammatically correct and that's what we have in his recitation um so sometimes that happens and these are wow. very rare very rare but those um, are awesome those are the fun i mean they're, 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 they're fantastic i mean it's, it's really fun it's really fun to see abu amr especially doing this i'm planning to write an article at some point about why or when the readers deviate from the rasan and, and and kind of exploring that thing is that on the edu page it's not no, it's not there yet. Okay. Um, so so I'm still writing it. Uh, I should be writing it, but I haven't started. Well, I have started writing it, it's just not finished. I think but, you did some on Twitter with this, right? Like you, yeah, yeah. I've certainly you... certainly talked about this, and just the other day I, I did some other things as well. Um, these are really interesting ones, and we have like traditions from from Aisha saying, uh, so that's the wife of the prophet, right. saying no, the, these are mistakes in the in the Mus'haf. These are mistakes in the Codex. Uh, just matter of fact, and it's like, okay, does it really go back to Asia? Who knows? But someone quite early on was spreading this tradition. Clearly, he thought it was less of a problem to say there were grammatical errors in the text than having a grammatical error in, in Revelation, right? That, that's where it comes down to. Um, so there's a really interesting um, thing going on with that. So they do that every now and then. They deviate from the text, not always to 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 fix grammatical mistakes. Every now and then they will have a variant which is found in other regional codices. So, the, so um, uh, Hafsas is a, uh, two times, two times, I think so, where the Kufan Codex doesn't have the reading he has, but the Basran one does. So apparently he was aware of the Basran Codex. He was like, well, you know, that's also Qurans, right? I can do this, so I can permit myself to to read this differently from the text because I think the text has it that I have is a bit ugly or something like that. So he, he felt free to do that. So that's a very typical thing where they borrow from a different region uh, a reading. Oh, man. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is fun. I love this. All right. Is there significant variability in manuscripts or manuscript evolution? Uh, well, once again, significant. Um, no, uh, I would say no, uh, really no. Uh, so yeah, every now and then, you run into variants in the text. Very often there's scribal errors, you know, just like in anything. Mm -hmm. uh, and those scribal errors don't really get reproduced. So, you know, we don't see, oh, someone started writing a scribal error in, in the fourth century. And by the, uh, you know, by the 10th century, everybody's writing it that way. Uh, that doesn't happen at all. Um, it's really every now and then you have an occasional variant. And some of them are kind of interesting. Um, so the famous one I just mentioned about, um, you know, uh, the angel or, or God, um, giving a child to um, to Mary. Uh, that one shows up in one very early manuscript, uh, actually has the, so that he may give you a pure son. And uh, this is in the British Library manuscript OR2165, where um, he 
yeah, he changed the text, and the rasm is different. So, so, so the consonantal skeleton has actually been fixed by the scribe, or it's fixed towards what he wanted, and so mm. he fixed it that way. And actually, the Sanat Palim says has the same variant, uh, which is interesting on the lower text. Um, so really these two were competing with each other, and some people felt, oh, no, I, I can change this. But what you don't see is then, because uh, that's an Assyrian manuscript, that you know, 100 years later, the Assyrian manuscripts are still doing this. No, no, they just get rid of it. They go back to the standard text. So they're clearly very meticulously not just copying, but they're also checking and testing and probably using multiple exemplars to copy from. Um, so when there were any conflicts, they could say, no, no, we need to go back to the standard text. <laughs> um, so, and those are the significant ones. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so the insignificant ones are even smaller. Uh, so there's really not many. The text is highly standardized. Um, every now and then, people go, you know, the, the text we have today is 100% the same thing as the Othmanic text. That's wrong. That's not true. There's hundreds of places where the spelling has changed over time. Um, but the spelling has changed over time. Uh, hasn't had much of an effect. So the example that we just looked at with uh, to say or he said, or say and he said, qala and qul, those used to be spelled the same in all early manuscripts. But by now, they are not. So now they have added the alif uh, for qala to distinguish the two from each other. And that's a ambiguity in the text which they got rid of. So that's an upgrade, an orthographic upgrade. Uh, that's typical. Another thing is some spellings start moving towards what becomes a classical Arabic spelling. So the spelling of the Quran is a bit different from what becomes classical Arabic spelling. And some of it starts moving towards that. Um, so another example would be Dhu, which means the one of, like in Dhul Qarnayn. Um, that used to be spelled with three letters, Dhal, Waw, Alif. And in the modern text that we have today, that Alif has been um, removed doesn't change the pronunciation. It means the exact same thing. There's nothing going on. But before it was ambiguous, because before it could be read as the wa, and that means uh, the two of the two horns, which is probably doesn't make sense there. But in some places, it, it, you could actually get an ambiguous reading there. So that fixed it. Um, and at some point, uh, so the Rasm is something adhered to very strongly in, say, the first four centuries. Um, they really copy meticulously. That disappears in parts of the Islamic world. They continue to do this in the Maghreb, so that's uh, uh, the, the uh, North Africa. And they continue to do this in Andalusia up until today. It's, a, it's an unbroken chain, and the spelling changes a little bit, but they are very meticulous about copying this. And their whole books are mostly written by Andalusians saying, you know, this word is spelled in this way, and this way, and this way, and it's very similar to um, the um, Masoretic text and Masoretic notes in, 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 right. in the Hebrew Bible, if that makes sense. Um, so, so it was very strongly controlled, but in the Eastern Empire, or the Eastern Islamic world, I should say, um, they stopped caring about this. And they start writing the Quran in classical Arabic orthography. Like, this is such a weird spelling. Why would we do this? We're just going to write it as normal. So by the year 1000, all of a sudden, we see manuscripts which are just written in perfectly classical Arabic. And for example, this example I just gave about Abu Amr reading Adaini and Viviani from the Rasm. And when a manuscript in this period starts writing uh, Abu Amr's reading, they also fix the Rasm there. They just follow along and just change the spelling. And the spelling is the, the, that connection between the original Rasm of, of Uthman um, is completely lost. And there's much more of a focus on how is the text actually recited. And this is probably no surprise that this happens just around the time that the canonical reading traditions get canonized. So there's a, a shift in focus from the written text, which was incredibly important and very strongly safeguarded, towards the oral text. And they would rather have a good transcription of how the oral performance was done than stick to the Uthmanic text as it was decreed by Uthman. Um, so that's very interesting that there's this kind of shift going on that in, in psychology about it. And like I said, that never changes in North Africa. They always just stick to, to the Uthmanic text. They're very, very serious about that. Mm -hmm. And then at some point, when people start printing the Quran again, they're like, wait a minute, now we need to think about what we're doing. And they start introducing the, the, the classical, say, the, the North African tradition again. So basically, the text that we have today, print Qurans, they're all identical as well. And they follow the Uthmanic orthography quite closely. There are some differences here and there, um, but, but it's really precise. And it's precise because they use these books, these Masoretic books, basically, that said, OK, this is how you're supposed to spell all these words. And they copied it. And that's what we have today. But if you look at manuscripts from around the same period, a bit earlier, have completely classical spelling in Egypt, for example, 
uh, and then the Ottoman Empire. So there's a real shift here. Like, no, no, we want to get back to the proper spelling again, and uh, which is something they had lost in that in that region. Mostly, every now and then you find a manuscript that does it, but most of them don't. This gets back to real quick on Uthman and this codified uh, mm -hmm. Quran. Um, do we, based on this idea that the Quran is is in the fifties, okay? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, or really not the 50s, so, so the yeah, 30s. So the 30s. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so the 30s, um, you know where I was going with that. Um, and there seems to be grammatical errors, it, or at least it seems like, a, is there any codified spelling issues, but yet the mm -hmm. oral is good even with that codified version? Because if there is, I'm asking just, to, this goes mm -hmm. back to the first question of dot for dot, right? Mm -hmm. It's like dot for dot, that is assuming the literary okay not the orality mm -hmm. the orality mm -hmm. is where the real poetry where the real mm -hmm. the real powers at in the tongue so to speak mm -hmm. uh whereas you know what we're saying is just textually this there might be something so do you think in the uthmanic uh codified quran that there are spelling issues out the gate or at least grammatical codified issues out the gate even if orality is still good yeah so it's well, the, the, the thing is, I mean, it's a, so, so it's, it's a difficult question, but part of, part, part of the reason why the question is difficult is, okay, what, what counts as an error? Um, uh -huh. So coming, coming at this as a linguist, um, so linguists describe language and describe language in a system of language. And the result of that is that any speaker is a good example of how to speak a language. You know how to speak a language, I know how to speak a language, and that's correct. And even though, um, say, standard English says you can't say ain't instead of I'm not, you know, I ain't, yeah. you can say that. And people say that and people find it absolutely unproblematic. That's just how you say it. And there's no rational reason to say why I ain't is wrong and I'm not is correct. You know, those two are just acceptable things to do. Now, a lot of these, these variants that we find in that sense, uh, so the ones that we're talking about, these, these grammatical errors, Clearly, some people thought they were grammatical errors. That's why they're being reported. And indeed, from, say, a strict classical Arabic point of view, they are incorrect. But I'm very reticent to say, no, those are those those are actually incorrect. Because I can think of a reason, because I'm a linguist. I can see mm -hmm. why why it will be like that. Uh, so probably to someone, it was grammatical, or it was a, a scribal error. But it's very difficult to tell, are we looking at a scribal error or not? Now, right. um, and, and also and, and the so idea that... that the idea that the the tribe that they're talking to it might fit within their like you talk about ain't well if mm -hmm. you're in the south right. you're gonna hear that more than i'm not so right. so if you're talking about the is it the koresh uh, tribe koresh yeah Qur koresh uh koresh, that yeah. that i try i always try that I tribe try. might play a significant role in the way that uh, the the literary text is being i guess you know written i don't know it does that yeah. play a role yeah, no. So, so it, it does um, it, to some extent. So, so I think I think even even classical Arabic spelling, but certainly Quranic spelling, is just a Qureshi spelling. That's how they wrote Arabic. And if we look at a papyri from the same period, that that's what it looks like. You know, it's not there's nothing magical to that in that sense. Um, but one interesting thing, which is kind of worth pointing out, is so some words can be written in multiple ways, and that's I guess the closest thing to a, a scribal error uh, that we find in the Quran. Um, I mean, it, it's kind of like, I mean, is, is that a, is that a mistake? I mean, it's, it's very different. So we have, I think like four, um, autographs of Shakespeare and he spells his name differently every time, um, which shows you something about how people thought about spelling in, in, in the pre, um, say, say pre-modern period. We don't have, they didn't have that strong a sense of, you know, this is how you write a word. And if it's not in a dictionary written that way, it's wrong. So are those issues? No. But what's really interesting about them is that some of these words can be written in two ways. So I, I wrote an article about this. You can read it. It's also open access. Um, and for example, uh, the word na'matullah is this phrase. It means the grace of God. And this first word, na'ma, um, can be either written with one letter or the other. Uh, so ta and ha, uh, those are two spellings that you can write it. Has absolutely no effect on the pronunciation, right? You, you 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 can write it in both ways. Not anymore in classical Arabic. You have to write it in only one way. But clearly, in the pre-classical period, uh, you could write it in both ways. Has no effect on the pronunciation. Has no effect on the meaning. It's just two different ways of spelling it. Now, 
What's interesting about this, we find this in the Quran. We find both of these spellings and this phrase, Ni'matullah or Ni'mat Rabbika and these kinds of things, uh, which means uh, not um, the grace of God, but the grace of your Lord, but these kinds of things. Uh, so this, this kind of construction occurs 23 times in the Quran. And in the modern print editions, it's spelled one way 11 times and the other way 12 times. So basically 50-50, right? It's an uneven number, so you can't actually go 50-50, yeah. but it's 50-50. It looks like it was completely up to up to the scribe to do whatever they wanted. The thing is, it wasn't up to the scribes. It wasn't the scribes who first wrote the Uthmanic text. They just wrote, and they apparently were like, well, I'll write it this time, uh, this way, this time, and I'll write it that way the other time. And after that, that became absolutely fixed, as if holy. You could not start changing those spellings, even though it has no effect on the meaning, no effect on the pronunciation, they did not fix it. So every single manuscript that you check uh, in the early ones, you'll find the exact same spelling. So, if, you know, in one verse, <laughs> you'll find this. So they really went went to extreme lengths wow. to, to completely reproduce this. And this is very important because what does it show us? It shows us that the text was always written in that sense. And they really cared about carefully copying every single spelling variant. Even if the spelling variant had no effect whatsoever, they made sure they copied it which means they certainly had a written exemplar. You could not do this by ear because it's pronounced the same. So it wasn't like someone was reciting the Quran and other people were writing it down. No, they had the text, looked at how it was spelled. It was like, okay, this is how it's spelled. This is how I'm going to copy it every single time. And um, that is very extreme, but it means that we can clearly show that every single manuscript that we have today goes back to a single archetype, one standardization text. And the dating of the text is early enough that it must have been around the time of Uthman. It really can't be much later. It could technically be earlier. I mean, we can't we can't know. But mm -hmm. this is when we see a standard text appear, and from that point onwards, um, it's there. So it's very, very, it's, it's extremely precise, and there's nothing really like this except maybe um, the Masoretic text of, of Hebrew, uh, which That's... first had a, had a more a, a much more chaotic history. But once it gets standardized, it's also copied in the exact same, very, very. Uh, precise way. I'm going to switch on light. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Otherwise, I look so dark. <laughs> look, this is now. this is amazing. Yeah. I don't want to miss. Uh, I don't want to forget what I what my personal question. Um, I'd love to ask you before we leave here. But uh, I've got a few more. I just wanted to mention though on this particular point you bring up. Mm -hmm. This goes back into what I said with Dr. Anthony, right? Like I want to know. What are the building blocks? I'm more of an investigator who's not going to go, you know, I'm like a Scooby-Doo, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and they go out. Everyone thinks it's magic. Everyone thinks it's a ghost. Everyone thinks it's a demon. And then you unmask it. You go, it was a human the whole time. It's mm -hmm. always a person behind the curtain, okay? Uh, the, the Wizard of Oz isn't really a wizard, right? Well, for me, I'm that kind of guy. I want to mm -hmm. look at who, what, when, where, why. And it's most likely for me uh, doing historical research it's got a human explanation or a natural explanation if a human's not involved. And one of the questions that I had in, in light of this that I think was really interesting is that we talked about Judaism, Christianity's influence on Islam, which I'm not going to get too far into this with you on this episode. Maybe one day we can talk about things and have a free, uh, not so academic discussion where we just float ideas around. But um, one of the things that makes me think about what you just said, how they're so adamant even on the spelling difference, which doesn't change a damn thing about how it's pronounced. Um, it makes me think that they had a playbook to go off of. And what makes me think that isn't like, a, I'm not thinking conspiracy, conspiracy mm -hmm. here, but you had Jews that were already doing this practice. And I very much doubt that they were living in a bubble to the point that they didn't see that the Jews had a standardized concept of the Masoretic, even though in the ninth century we have like an official codice of the Masoretic text, they were practicing this. So were Christians practicing textual, you know, passing down the literature. So I, I just think they picked it up there. That's just my opinion. We don't have to go into Yeah, well, I mean, no, no, I, I can go into it a little bit. Um, yeah. I mean, they're the clear parallels, uh, especially with the Hebrew Bible. Um, to the point, I mean, also uh, in terms of the reading tradition, these kinds of things, there's clearly something going on. And sometimes it's very difficult to say who's who's cross-pollinating who. Um, uh, the Hebrews themselves, or to say the Jews themselves, also have a, a, a moment uh, where you get the Karaites in, in the Middle Ages who start, uh, who have the same kind of effect that um, 
uh, Muslims have at some point that they stop caring about the written text and start caring about the recitation. Mm -hmm. And what they start doing is it's they completely let go of the Masoretic text. They don't follow the Masoretic text at all. Um, they actually start writing the Hebrew Bible in Arabic letters because it's oh. more accurate to write the language that way and you can be more precise and they give them the hebrew vowels because the hebrew vowels are more precise than the arabic vowels so you actually have and it looks crazy when you see it but you actually have hebrew written in the arabic text with hebrew vowels below them and that wow. very precisely and so so and these people uh, are the ones who wrote books on the reading traditions of of, of, of the hebrew bible in extreme detail and I, I was very interested in this because I'm very interested in the reading tradition in general. I was looking for, you know, what are the contexts here, these kinds of things. And then you start reading these books and you're like, wow, that's nothing like the traditional uh, reading traditions in, 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 in Arabic for, for the Quran, uh, which is, I mean, they're very different, different traditions and doing different things. And even though the outcome is similar and they're kind of in a similar environment, actually, they don't use similar kind of vocabulary. They don't, they don't really think about it in that way. They don't even organize... Um, the text in the same way. So it's really surprising. It was really surprising to me is like how dissimilar they are. They are similar in many ways, but I was expecting, no, they must be using the same words for these for, for these concepts and that kind of thing. And they don't do that at all. They're very different words, uh, which I thought was interesting. Yeah. Wow. Uh, but clearly, I mean, there, there must be also this kind of preciseness. Um, I think there, there, there's also a kind of um, a, a attempt to not be like the Bible and not be, uh, you know, be the, the proper final text, have it codify it real quickly, be very precise about it, and don't have all these, you know, nonsense where two sects of Christianity can't even agree which books go into the Bible. Exactly. Um, and and so, so I mean, that must be playing uh, in, in the back of the minds also because the Quran makes that pretty explicit. Um, that is different in that way. The Quran is here to kind of fix these texts and fix, you know, the, the, this, the message that has been messed up um by, by the previous religions and now this will be the real message and we better safeguard it and of course even um the quran and this is why it's a miracle to a lot of people promises the safeguarding of the text right they right. say the text is preserved because the quran says the text is preserved of course that's through the actions of men they are preserving the text and they are very adamant about it which for good reason because if, they, if they're not adamant about it then all of a sudden the miracle isn't true anymore um, so, so there's an interesting kind of thing going on there. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy, but but there is a there is a, a miracle happening, and I, I can see how how people seeing this very very precise uh, copying. And you know, my, my article was very popular with Muslims because, like, look, I mean, a, a, a Western scholar shows that the text is preserved, which is true. I, I do show that the text yeah. is preserved from Uthman onwards. Who knows what was going on before that? Um, now, how precise? I mean, like down to the period mark, or you know, I'm using a yes, modern example. Yeah, yeah, they're really, really, yeah, they're, really, 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 yeah, they're yeah. really trying to do that. I just don't think yeah. it. For me, like someone tried to. I didn't know much about this when they came on my channel, and they were like, mm -hmm. "The Quran is a miracle," and I'm like, mm -hmm. I was like shocked to hear it because I don't know the right. culture, I don't know, it. and I'm like, right, 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 right. "It's a miracle." Like, what do you mean? The book itself is, and this and that, and people have memorized the whole thing. That proves it's a miracle, and I'm like. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I'm used to people walking on water and the dead rising out of the grave to be a miracle, but I guess that's a different kind of thing. And to me, it just didn't really shock me. It kind of made me go, huh? But I'm also, you know, I'm a skeptic. So, no, but, but, but so, so, I mean, but it's, but it's certainly worth appreciating. Um, the text is very, very, very closely safeguarded. Also the recitation and in these changes of transmission, these kind of things. And it's, it's, um, you know, depending on how, you know, whatever you do with, with the, um, with the tradition, you really end up, appreciating just how diligent they were and how serious they were about it, how precise they were about it. It's really, really impressive right. and beautiful uh, and, and cool and that we you know, can open up these books and find out these things, even about the spelling. And that's, that's just fascinating, I think. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. All right. Um, three more questions and I got my final questions. I got to let you go because, uh, you know, I know you got to do some stuff. So can canonical readings be rejected? Why did Tabari reject canonical readings? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, so yes, canonical readings can be rejected and at some point they can't be anymore. So Atabari uh, that we're talking about is one of the great early exegetes. He lives in the end of the third Islamic century and um, he wrote a big exegesis and also a big history and he wrote a lot of things and he was brilliant, uh, but he wrote an exegesis of the Quran and he talks about the different variant readings and he'll evaluate them. He says, well, some people read this, some people read that. 
and I think this is better, um, or <laughs> both of them are fine. And sometimes he says, this is garbage. You can't do this. You can't recite it like this. And some of those are canonical readings today. Of course, when he's writing, they're not, right? There is no right. canon of the canonical readers until, well, actually his lifetime. Um, so <laughs> he dies a bit before Ibn Mujahid, but they were both from Baghdad. And, um, and they knew each other, um, probably, uh, but they're, they're contemporaneous. And then Ibn Mujahid canonizes it. And after that, it becomes, well, at least even after that, people still reject readings every now and they're like, no, I think this is better. And it becomes more careful. They're, they're less, this is wrong. Uh, but they'll still say, I think this is better. Um, I right. think this fits better. This is more fitting, etc." And then around the 700s Hijri, uh, something changes. Um, and I must say, I mean, this actually requires research. Figuring out where does that shift kind of take place? Uh, and technically, Shari Nasser has some, done some of this in his book, but I, it's a really interesting thing where all of a sudden when you get to people like Abu Hayyan, who wrote Bahr al-Muhayt, um, which is an enormous exegesis, incredibly eloquent. But to him, the idea that you could suggest that one of these readings, which are, of course, mutawatir, he, he was very right. clear about this. To him, they were there was tawatur. Um, how dare you even suggest that, that it's incorrect? I mean, that, that's impossible because we have a good chain and he was a pure Arab and, you know, all these things go up and it's like, no, you can't reject these readings anymore. Um, there's a tension that comes up in my mind, but we might have to talk about that some other yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, cool. But there's, there's an interesting question. I'll, I'll do it very quickly. So there's an interesting question about what makes a, a reading valid. And there are always three things. It has to agree with the Rasm, which is interesting because the Rasm didn't exist at the time that the Prophet existed, right? right. Uh, that was sometime after him. So it has to agree with the Rasm. It has to have a good chain of transmission and it has to have good Arabic grammar. But of course, at some point, this, this, this chain of transmission becomes so important that like, well, the chain of transmission is good, so it can't be bad Arabic, um, right? Because the chain of transmission is perfect. We know that it went back to a person who had uh, impeccable standards. So if he considered it proper Arabic, it's proper Arabic. So that can't be wrong. Um, so the, 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 the requirement of proper Arabic starts dropping away. While before, like in the time of al it was perfectly reasonable to say some of these readings were wrong and wrong for grammatical reasons. But at some point, that, that kind of rationality about that gets relegated to, no, chain of transmission is the only thing that matters. Even though in form, people still say the three things matter, but that's not true. The only thing that matters is the chain of transmission these days. Um, and so, and what's even interesting, so not only al tabari rejects readings, even Ibn Mujahid himself, so the, the guy who canonized the seven readings in his book that became the canon of the seven readings, there's a couple of times where he says, no, I think this is wrong. Um, he's, he's wrong about this. And even so, he, he's, he's, um, he's a, a student of one of the transmitters of Ibn Kathir. He said, no, I, I think my teacher is wrong here. That this can't be right. The end. Right, so that that that's it. Um, so that's really interesting, and that that totally shifts uh, at some point to the point that right now it's these readings are totally unassailable. They were, they were perfectly assailable. They were even assailable to the person who canonized themselves. Um, so that's a really interesting kind of thing that is going on. Yeah. Wow. All right. All right. Can any canonical readings be grammatically incorrect? We did yeah. that one. We did that one. Yeah, basically, basically it's the same thing. So we talked about some of it already. And once again, some of these get rejected for grammatical reasons. Right. Okay. What if two canonical readings contradict? Are there any examples? Yeah, we, 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 we kind of touch upon some of those as well. So, so the giving uh, of a pure boy by the angel, or those are technically in contradiction, I suppose. Um, are there any blatant ones that you can think of? Even one example? Yeah. Yeah. Like, like none of them are really coming to mind real quickly. But you have a couple of those cases where um, some person says something that either you or I did it. Uh, I think it was Moses or was it Noah. Well, either way. It's not coming to mind right now. But right. He, he really can't have said both. And they're yeah. in contradiction with each other. And the event, I mean, like, like the general event is still the same thing. But they kind of contradict. And they do. They're, they're irreconcilable. Um, and right. there's quite a few of those. Some of them are quite easy reconcilable. It's like, okay, one person just thought it was more, you know, it's the difference between um, they killed the children or, or they massacred the children. I mean, is that really a difference in meaning? Yeah. They just put the <laughs> emphasis somewhere else. So th those are easily reconcilable. And right. uh, they're not in contradiction. But some of them, yes, are, are slightly 
more difficult to reconcile and you just have to translate them differently and that's what people do so there's a translation the bridges translation it's called and you can you can even see it on quran.com uh, uh, um which actually gives footnotes like okay you know some others read it in a different way and you have to translate it like this um so you need different translations and that's the way it goes yeah so they can contradict and uh usually quite easy easy to reconcile sometimes harder and it's like okay well yeah it has to be one of the two but both of them have very good good authority so which one of the two is correct it's hard to say yeah wow final question this is my own personal little uh i'm big into intertextuality uh, I'll give you an example as I lead up my question to kind of paint it for you so that people who are watching can also see where I'm coming from. Apologists that I deal with in Christianity and Judaism, mainly in Christianity, I don't really engage Jews when it comes to the Hebrew Bible. Uh, but like there's tons of scholars I talk to who see intertextuality between like Noah, let's say, uh, the flood narrative or creation myths of the Bible and the Mesopotamian literature where we see the Epic of Gogamesh, and then, of course, older literature, where we just kind of see these gods, Marduk's fighting against Tiamat, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And we do know there's intertextuality. We have some reference to know. They're definitely borrowing from here. Um, the question I have, and it's probably a little different when it comes to the Quran and what is being done here, but, for example, with the G Jesus tradition, when I hear of infant narratives, okay, infancy oh. gospels, I like when I'm reading them from the Christian perspective and I'm going into the second, third century looking at this, I'm going, this is almost actually a comedy. Like it, it, mm -hmm. it's actually being written. A lot of the scholars I talked to are like, like when they wrote this, this was kind of like, we love Jesus and we love the narratives of Jesus. Even if we know that this isn't really what happened. Mm -hmm. um, it's a comedy in some sense. They're writing narratives to be kind of funny and whatnot. We're finding these narratives in from what I understand in the Quran, we see infancy gospel borrowing or intertextuality. So is there any clear evidence as a linguist? And of course, you're not just a linguist. I mean, you're a textual linguist. You, you, you know, the languages you're looking at the stuff closely. Is there any clear borrowing? If I can use the term, what I mean is intertextuality of this literature in its development. It seems like a hodgepodge of ideas because you have inf infancy gospel, but we don't want him crucified. Right. Mm -hmm. But we want him mm -hmm. to be uh, a, a prophet and we want him born of a virgin, but we don't want him this, you know, and then right. they do this stuff. Like what's going on? Yeah. So, 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 uh, I mean, it, it, it's a bit outside of my wheelhouse, but I'm happy, happy to, to opine a little bit on it. Um, so what we can clearly see in the Quran, I, I think, and this, 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 this should be very obvious is that the Quran absolutely assumes knowledge of the Bible. Uh, and assumes that the audience knows about this because mm -hmm. uh, it constantly gives versions of the stories of stories where you're like, if I had not known the story, this would have made no sense whatsoever. <laughs> uh, really, I mean, they're, they're, it, it can be extremely, ex extremely short and not really explained anywhere else. And you're like, well, that that's, and it even often says, you know, remember when, et cetera, et cetera. Clearly, the Quran is assuming people to actually be able to remember these things. And, um, you know, the seven sleepers is a famous story, of course, where it's like, okay, there's clear details there. And what's really interesting is that the Quran is in some ways, and I, I, I use this analogy every, every now and then, um, is patching the stories. It's, it's, it's like, it's like, a it's like a, a video game patch or a software patch. It's like, okay, well, you know, this story, remember this story. Well, actually what happened, is a little different uh, and you know and starts so you know it, it really cares about that everybody understands there's no trinity there's just one god jesus was a swell guy but you know you, you can't um you can't say he was the son of god and and that's quite important and a lot of other stuff is perfectly fine and then you get the stuff with the cross and it, it's, it gets weird so it constantly yeah. jumps in with these kind of stories and, and it's very circumspect about what the story is actually about and it just says remember this important juncture when this happened okay well you know change change it a bit like this and then we have the real story um and that's 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 a really interesting and that makes the quran a a strange text um a very different kind of text than, than the kind of narrative um flow that maybe the bible has um so that that's kind of thing but yes there's this constant constantly this constant assumption that that the text was known and of course, that you know is supposed to be part of the miracle. You, you talked about this with John Anthony a little bit. Um, 
uh, where <laughs> they don't want you know, him to be a merchant and bubble right, exactly and right and, and also you know they, they didn't didn't he get inspired by someone else exactly right yeah and I mean, okay, sure. I mean, so maybe, maybe it's divine revelation, that's a possibility too. But um, but it's clearly interacting with something, and it's right. clearly clearly doing something with that, uh, with these other texts. And uh, and I think you get a different appreciation of the Quran if you know these other texts and kind of see how they're interacting, because that's clearly part of the intention. Well, if the audience knows, then that it goes beyond for me as the Scooby Doo mm-hmm. guy who wants to pull the hat off, uh, realizing what's going on here. It wasn't. In my opinion, if if we're going to assume, and I'm going to just assume that Muhammad is definitely in communication with either rabbis or Jew or, or Christians, some form Manichaean, I don't know what what version. Um, maybe he's bumping into various types of Christians. I don't know. Point I'm I'm bringing up is it couldn't have just been him. It sounds like his audience, his tribe, has come across this stuff, or at least is familiar. And I've heard people try to theorize, and this is completely guessing game mm-hmm. here that they weren't they were originally some form of a christian sect or something mm-hmm. that they came out of and gave their own little spin i don't know because intertextuality yeah. is about what changes it's not like people think oh you mean he borrows like it's exact xerox no right. it's no. the differences that really make you go That's whoa it. yeah so anyway yeah no i mean so so uh, all i want to say about about this for now is it's this is, I think, one of one of one of the big challenges when, when looking at the literary side of things and these intertextuality things. Like, how exactly should we be modeling the Quranic audience? Right. And how do we rhyme this with um, with what the tradition tells? The tradition, you know, tells a lot about paganism, and the Quran is not very interested in pagans at all. Um, it's interested in, 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 in Christianity, it's interested in Judaism, and it's interacting with that. And, and partially is because it's obviously in, in that tradition. So of course, you know, um, the Quran likes to say more about that than anything else. But uh, who knows? Um, and, and so figuring out like, okay, who, who, were, who was his audience? And can that audience be the same people that the tradition presents to us? Um, I think it can be a bit difficult to rhyme at times. Uh, so yeah. I think we need to think about what what the um, what the audience was like. Uh, which is not to say that we should be thinking in a completely different region. Um, uh, Petra is nonsense. Um, it's clearly, and I think <laughs> ling- linguistically, um, the the Quran very clearly shows to come from the Hejaz, and that is exactly where we expect it to come from. Uh, and that's really cool that you can get that from linguistic evidence. Um, but what was Hejaz like? Who were living there? What were they doing? Um, what were the positions within, say, you know, Christianity, Judaism, and and, and um, uh, paganism? And what what did paganism mean in that sense? Uh, yeah. Clearly, they still had Allah, and you know, and Christianity is all around, of course, that too. I mean, it's in South Arabia, uh, it's in North uh, North Arabia, and why wouldn't it be in between? Yeah, I didn't even get into the questions of, of I, th- I suspect you agree with Sean Anthony about uh, mm-hmm. Allah, where the name comes from. I I asked him about pantheon of deities, but some people try to say moon god or something like this, and like they try to, but uh, yeah, I, I he no, I, I mean, so so so, 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 the, the, there's interesting things here. I, I just did a thread on Twitter about uh, the, the, the origin of Allah. Um, I think I have a slightly more subtle. Um, well, that, that sounds unfair to Sean. Um, I don't mean it that way. Uh, but I, but I, 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 saw him, I saw him talk about it. I was like, oh, no, I, I think I should be saying this in a slightly more subtle way, and I'll do a thread about it, which subsequently exploded. Um, and um, where I took a little bit about it. But the point is, Allah um, is a pagan god um, to some pagans at some point, um, because people call, them, call themselves, you know, uh, uh, and they write invocations to Allah along with other gods. And Muslims go, well, that's obviously, I mean, that's what the Quran says as well. They're associating other gods, but he doesn't seem to be the main god at all. He doesn't seem to be the head of the pantheon. Uh, but we're also talking about inscriptions that are in Arabic from Jordan, um, which is very far away, 700 years earlier. So that might not be a reflection of what Allah was like in, in say, um, the Hijaz at this time. Uh, this is like of, finding the word you know, L in Canaanite uh uh, tradition right. and then all of a sudden it's monotheistic in judaism good point good point yeah interesting no, so it's, it's very similar to that and and so, so there are interesting questions going on there and um i had one one tiny thought to finish that up um Sorry. 
No, that's okay. Uh, so yeah, so and the question of Moon God, I don't know where that comes from. I, I uh, as far as I know, we have absolutely no indication what people thought Allah was before this. Uh, so even even in a pagan context, he does show up in a pagan context. It's not obvious they're talking about him as a Moon God. Um, it's not obvious what he does at all, but not a moon god. So we don't know what his function was. As a god. You said 700 yeah. years. Are you talking about first century in Jordan? No, no. I'm, I'm talking. I'm, so I'm talking about about the year zero in our our calendar time. Um, so we have in inscriptions in Arabic. Hours. In the like our 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 yes hours. Okay. okay. So so CE um, or or got it. Uh, AD. Um, so, so that's zero, a zero. first century. The name Allah is being used in yeah. Arabic. Yeah. Yeah, and even before that, so the Nabataeans in 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 Jordan um, used the name uh, all throughout. Uh, so we have tons of people called Abdullah. Um, so you know the the slave of God or the servant of God, uh, which was apparently also the name of Muhammad's father. Um, which I mean, he clearly didn't make up the name. Uh, the name right. has been around. But what's interesting is that the name is mostly being used in in, in pagan contexts. And whenever Christians talk about God, they call him El Ilah, which just means the God. Um, so what's going on there? Why, when did they get conflated? Why did they get conflated? Because they do get conflated. And today, Christians and Jews call, call God Allah as well. Um, yeah. That's just the way you do it. If you speak Arabic, that, that's his name. And even, you know, yeah. Wow. Okay. Holy moly. <laughs> Too much. We have so much exactly. in this. I don't know if anyone can handle what just happened over the last two hours and 15 minutes. This was amazing. I Good. seriously highly recommend everybody go and support him. I don't care if you don't like Berber. You need to go and buy the book because, look, I, I mean, that's actually quite an expensive book. That's not your choice. Uh, you know, it it used to be cheaper. Um, I, wow. I, I know I know that when it went on sale, it was, it was 40 euros, which I thought was a very decent price for an academic book. But um, yeah. I guess this is a secondhand one. Maybe they didn't like my book and not a, or they liked it so much that they wanted way more money for it. I don't know. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Interesting. But, um, well, you've got the one coming out that will be free. So, so yes. anyway, if you're and it'll be about the Quran and not about Berber. So, uh, for, for people who are interested in Quranic stuff, you will not get much out of this grammar. It's a wonderful grammar. I think it's a great language uh, from from a Libyan Berber dialect. But you know, um, that that's something I, I did in the past. Awesome. Well, <laughs> Definitely. You can... If you want to read about the Quran, check out my academia page. That yeah. has tons of tons of stuff on there. Go yeah. right now. Check him out. Follow him. I'm about to do that right now. I hope I'm logged in. Am I logged in? No, I need to log in when I get off uh -huh. here. Okay. So I'm going to make sure I follow you here. And um, I hope that uh, your hair comes back. You're looking pretty <laughs> swagged out right <laughs> here, man. I don't think it will be coming back. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but look, he's he writes. After a show like this, you can see why I'm saying go check him out for sure. Also, uh, it's in the vein of this. It'll be Brill, the book that's going to come. It'll be free where everybody can check it out. You really want to have your mind blown, uh, you know, or put to sleep if you can't handle this kind of material. This is something to read. It's worth checking out. I really appreciate you coming on the show. And I tell everybody always, hey, look, check us out on the Patreon. All of this stuff finds its way early. I want to make academic research fun and try the best to filter it in a way for a general public, for a bigger audience that finds it relevant. And you don't have to be a specialist to say, hey, where are the origins of Allah? Like, what are the origins of Islam? Like, these are fun things. People love watching the History Channel. Um, and a lot of times it's not even factual. They have these, you know, people on there that aren't really painting the picture properly. Or there's a conspiracy theorist on there, like ancient aliens, you know, things like that. And they're not getting actual academics to go and look into this. So I highly recommend everybody go join the Patreon. This is another way to help support a channel that wants to bring it to you. I want to bring you, look, speaking in tongues, you know, all this fun stuff. You know, where does this come from? What is it actually talking about? Mostly the things I'm dealing with are biblical, but we also are now exploring Islam. And uh, I want to do more in this because it's also monotheistic. It's not fair that I only focus on the two, uh, but I want all three. With the whole family, come on, let's sing Kumbaya. But uh, I appreciate you so much for coming on here. Is there any final words? Uh, no, well, I was I was very happy to be here. It was great. Um, follow me on Twitter. I'm very very uh, active there. That's at phdnix. And um, and if you think that stuff I do is great, um, you can also become a uh, backer on my Patreon or give me a coffee uh, because right now I am not employed. So uh, oh, hopefully wow. that will change soon. 
but you know, I mean, it's academic, it's hard to get a job and it's hard to find funding for things and hopefully it'll work out and then I don't need to beg for that kind of stuff. But for now, it's lo a lot of fun to, to, to do it and it's great when people like it. So that's all I say and look forward to my book, which will be free because apparently, well, I wouldn't have got money anyway because it's a book. <laughs> well, um, it might, if, if, if you let someone like me actually get it and present it to an audience that it can be understandable, uh, some people may not be able to read all that, but uh, yeah, either way, the point is, this is a good way. I, if I'd have known you had a patron, I'd already uh, mentioned this up front, but all of this patron, the Twitter, the academia webpage, all of that will be down in the description. Please, if you find critical scholarship in this area interesting and you're able to afford, go down and join his patron. I would actually much rather you do that to show the academics that I'm bringing on uh, that I appreciate them. And I want them to come on to Myth Vision more. So he's definitely in a, in a more dire situation than me. So I please ask you to do that. If you've made it this far, it's obvious you appreciate this stuff. And um, if you're able, of course, I, I ask you to go and join his patron. So thank you. I really appreciate it. No problem. I was so happy to be here. It was a lot of fun. Absolutely. Don't leave anywhere real quick. And don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, we are myth vision ladies and gentlemen i hope you enjoyed that show i have hundreds of other ones on the patreon letting you guys know you can help us continue doing what we're doing at myth vision podcast also you can have questions asked to the academics that i research with and i interview your question can be asked in a 1080p high quality video that might end up on youtube like I said, ladies and gentlemen, I want to expose the cults, show these superstitions for what they are, and the errors within these texts and all of these religions to help people realize they're all man-made and that we have what it takes. All we need to do is pull together. And let me tell you something. The religious world has the financial backing that those skeptics such as myself don't have. So if you want to help and be a participant, you can for a little, little bit a month. It's not much. If you want to go more, you can. But like I said, this is how I can keep the lights on for Myth Vision. 